Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and the Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute, I am delighted to welcome you here today uh, to the Food as Medicine National Summit. Thank you so much. I'm glad you all are having so much fun and, and meeting so many people. It's really, really, really wonderful. My name is Ronit Rydberg. I am a member of the research faculty here at the Friedman School and have the pleasure of serving as your host today. Welcome also to the viewers online. Apparently there are more than 1,000 of you. So we're really, really pleased to have you be able to join us. All of you here today, here and online and in the overflow rooms, uh, uh, we, you are all leaders across many, many sectors, right? We have healthcare leaders, providers and payers. We have research institutions, leaders from government, from advocacy, from philanthropy, uh, as well as food and technology. All of us here together in person, in one room and in one space. Importantly, your co-attendees also include participants, recipients, and service providers of food as medicine programs, whose lived experience is critical to advancing and strengthening food as medicine. Planning an event of this nature was a really exciting undertaking, undertaking and truly a collaborative effort. I'd like to recognize now members of our summit steering committee and summit partnership circle. It has been a pleasure to work together over the last year. Um, if those of you who are present can just give a show of your hands um, so that you can be seen, I would appreciate that. Summit uh, st steering committee and partnership circle. Don't be shy. Great, thank you. <laughs> A really very special thank you to Ursula Zabo, who has done an outstanding job managing, really. <laughs> Ursula, wave your hand. Uh, managing every single aspect of this summit's logistical details, including communicating, I think, with every single one of you here in your seat. Um, thank you so much. We could not have done this without you. To our esteemed speakers and panelists and moderators, we are so grateful to all of you for being here, for sharing your exp expertise and reflections with us during the course of this summit. I also extend a special welcome to the organizations who are members of the Tufts Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute and Council, led by Executive Director Katie Stebbins. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I want to acknowledge the foundations that have provided financial support for this summit. Core support was provided by Kaiser Permanente, with additional support from the Baya Echo Foundation, the Hand Foundation, Seeding the Future, and the Rockefeller Foundation. In addition, this summit is part of the larger nutrition policy in initiative at the Friedman School, which is an ongoing effort to advance the science and implementation of innovative, evidence-based policies and programs to improve nutrition, reduce food insecurity, and advance health equity. We'd like to thank the more than 100 members of the Food and Nutrition Advisory Coalition for their support in advancing nutrition science, nutrition security, and food as medicine in the United States. To make the best use of our time today, we are going to be keeping our introductions very short. Um, you all received or should have received PDFs of the speaker bios, and we have some extra copies in the lobby. So please refer to those. Um, during the breaks and the reception, please take an opportunity in the halls to visit the research posters that are showcasing work by members and partners of the Friedman School. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christina Economos, the interim dean at the Friedman School, to share some welcome remarks. Thank you, Ernie. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the Friedman School. We haven't had this many people in the auditorium in over three years. So thank you all for making the time to come today. We're really excited to host this summit, which brings together partners on a national scale who are focusing on food as medicine. And I want to just take a minute to tell you about the work at the Friedman School. The faculty here are currently engaged in eight different research and policy projects in this area. And you can see our new website up here and learn more about all of the projects. So just for example, we have the largest randomized controlled trial to date of produce prescriptions for treatment of patients with diabetes in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente, the largest randomized controlled trial to date of medically tailored meals for the treatment of patients with cancer, a new NIH-funded randomized controlled trial to increase local 
production and consumption of fruits and vegetables to address diabetes in the Mississippi River Delta, assessing the impact of medically tailored meals on obesity, other health outcomes, and healthcare utilization in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under Medicaid flexible services, and a randomized controlled trial of produce prescriptions and medically tailored meals in collaboration with the Georgia Institute in Australia, and last, development and testing of screeners to assess nutrition security in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente and the Los Angeles County Health Department, now evaluated in more than 18,000 Americans in different parts of the country. So that's just an example. We have many more, and we invite you to learn more about those. So we're really delighted to spend time with all of you to highlight the tremendous growth of food as medicine programs and policies and to work together to determine some of the biggest opportunities that lie in front of us toward expansion and integration of food-based programs into healthcare delivery to improve health and to address and improve health equity. I want to specifically thank Dari Mozafarian and Ronit Rydberg and their entire team for this extraordinary work planning and executing this important meeting that we're hosting today. And I look forward to all the talks and to getting to talk to each of you over the next couple of days. Welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rydberg, and thank you, Dean Economos. Um, it's really a pleasure to welcome you here and welcome everyone online. Um, it's very unusual to organize a meeting and have more than 100 people want to attend, and we had to say no because we were we were full. And so apologies to those who are online or in overflow, overflow rooms who couldn't attend. But it, it shows the power and excitement of food as medicine and, and what this can mean for, for the country. And so I want to just, for a few minutes, kind of give a, 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 an overview of kind of why we're here and, and what it means to think about food as medicine. So high level, you know, we know these statistics, but it's just really important to, to, to think about them. Um, we are so sick as a nation, and this is relatively new. This has happened in my lifetime. Uh, it really, since I was a high school graduate, this has happened. Just in the last 30 years or so, we have become incredibly sick. This is not the normal state of, of human uh, condition. One in two adults in the US have diabetes or prediabetes. Three in four have overweight or obesity. And if you put that together with blood pressure and cholesterol levels, only one in 15 adults in the US are metabolically healthy. So most people are walking around sick and they don't even know they're sick. And much of this, much of this is related to diet related disease. And tragically, this starts young. So even among teenagers, teenagers, one in four teens have prediabetes. We should just like, just, you know, have all of those teens go to Congress and, and, and you know, we would have changes in policies uh, overnight. This is not acceptable to have so many sick Americans. And beyond kind of the immediate, you know, obvious illnesses like hypertension and diabetes and cancer and, and obesity, there's other major societal costs. There's just two examples, and we could have many, many more. Diet-related diseases like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension have contributed to an estimated three quarters of a million excess US deaths from COVID-19 that could have been prevented if we had a more metabolically healthy population since the start of the pandemic. And if you look at the economic costs of, of diet-related uh, uh, illnesses, the direct uh, attributable costs of diet-related illness, not, not all diabetes, not all obesity, what is attributable to poor diet is estimated by the Rockefeller Foundation to be over $1.1 trillion every year we are losing due to healthcare spending and lost productivity. Now, there's also positives about where we can move forward, and I really want to emphasize this. This is not a fight against tobacco where there's a single terrible product that we have to eliminate. We all need food. This is really also about innovation and about unlocking the power of food and, and doing positive things with food. And, and there's so much power here from our farms to our retailers, to our manufacturers, to everything in between. One in 10 jobs in the US are directly supported by the food and agricultural sector. I don't think most Americans realize that. And it contributes to over a trillion dollars in economic output and, and, and $200 billion uh, in exports. And if we want to think about equity and economic empowerment, the number one source of both new small businesses and new small jobs in ethnic minority communities are in the food sector. Food trucks, bodegas, farms, you know, other ways of getting, getting food to people. So this is also very powerful for, for uh, increasing economic empowerment. Consumers now, for really the first time in my career, are really starting to demand 
healthier, more authentic, more nourishing foods. And there's also investors are starting to demand this through ESG investing and, and other metrics. So there's really a potential tipping point here putting all these things together. So that's where the power of food as medicine comes in. And I just want to say that there's not one definition of food as medicine. So I just want to center the meeting in, in what we're talking about here. These are three kind of, I think, common ways food as medicine is used. Um, you know, the first is just the very general broad concept that food is fundamental, foundational to health. And most people that I hear use this don't even like the term food as medicine because they say it's medicalizing food and they say food is health. Um, I've, I've heard that, that term. And so that's, of course, true, uh, but it's very broad uh, and general. The second way, which is also important and true, is that food can actually be medicine through the hundreds of thousands of natural bioactive compounds, over a million now uh, uh, natural bioactive compounds that have been discovered in foods like coffee and cocoa and green tea and, and extra virgin olive oil. These natural bioactive compounds at very small trace levels have really powerful potential biologic effects and we can unlock those as medicinal compounds in pills or supplements or functional foods. That's a second definition. But the third definition, the one that I think we want to focus on here and is really the spirit of this meeting, is a, is a more specific definition of food as medicine, which is food-based nutritional interventions integrated into healthcare to treat or prevent disease. And there's some, some really key points around this that I want to, want to highlight. First, this is centered in health equity. Um, a lot of the healthcare system actually it doesn't improve or even in some cases exacerbates uh, health inequities because those who have the worst health have the least access to some of the most life-saving and most uh, disease-reducing treatments. Here, food is medicine interventions in healthcare are actually directed at people who often uh, are, are suffering the most and are most in need. Second, this is focusing on nutrition security. This is not a food security uh, intervention. It's a nutrition security intervention, but it also simultaneously addresses food insecurity. And related to that, food as medicine and healthcare is not addressing social determinants of health. This is not about food security and wages and um, jobs and all of the incredible social challenges that healthcare does need to sort of understand and refer patients to appropriate external resources for. This is a determinant of health. This is healthcare actually addressing the, the top determinant of health, which is nutrition through essentially yeah, effective treatments to, to, for, for patients with specific diseases. Now, this is from a Google Analytics looking since 2010 to the present at the searches in the United States on the term food as medicine. And I did a global search and it looks almost exactly the same if you look globally. And you see from about 2010 till about 2021, there's been a slow and steady rise in interest in kind of the concept of food as medicine. But after around 2021, and I don't know what happened in 2021, the beginning, you know, COVID, other things, you know, coming on, there's been a rapid, rapid increase in, in just interest and in, in understanding and trying to understand what food as medicine uh, can do and what it, what it means. So I think this meeting, we're at a tipping point to really push this forward. And that's the, that's the goal of this meeting is to take this interest and excitement and knowledge and understand what to do next. Um, so thinking about that third definition of food as medicine, food-based nutrition uh, interventions in healthcare, you know, these can be conceived of as a pyramid. And I want to thank, you know, co-authors from the CDC and the Food as Med Medicine Coalition and Harvard Law School for putting together this, this commentary and kind of how we think about food as medicine. You can think of it as a pyramid of interventions where at the top of the pyramid, you have the most intensive specific interventions for the smallest number of extremely sick patients down to the base of the pyramid for population level programs. And medically tailored meals, uh, which you know, we're going to talk a lot about uh, over the next couple of days, are sort of at the top of the pyramid. Medically tailored grocery boxes, produce prescriptions, those are like the three core food as medicine interventions. And all of those come along with nutrition counseling and education, culinary education, which is really important to amplify those benefits. And there's further than you know, broader uh, uh, you know, interventions referring and integrating patients to nutrition security programs like SNAP and WIC and school meals. And then of course, population level healthy food policies and programs that can be implemented by CDC, FDA, you know, other agencies of, of the government. Um, and I'm really happy and, 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 and uh, just delighted that this, this concept of, of nutrition and integrating nutrition is taking off across the federal government. And I wanna specifically thank Secretary Vilsack for really being, I think, the chief nutrition officer of the United States in this administration, focusing on nutrition security and bringing and integrating nutrition security into USDA. And there's various definitions, but one definition we've proposed 
of, of nutrition security is consistent access, availability, and affordability of foods and beverages that promote well-being and prevent, and if needed, treat disease. And now, importantly, this is not meant to replace food security as a, as a measure. Food security must continue to be measured and addressed. This is additive. This is moving beyond addressing calories and talking about addressing nourishing foods. As mentioned, nutrition security is centered in health equity. It's not a social determinant of health. It's a determinant of health. And we have developed screeners for the organizations that are interested here, an effective two-question screener to address nutrition security. I also want to highlight the incredible movement going on in the country, action going on in the country around food as medicine. And this is just one example. This is a, a report that we have in progress in collaboration with our, our colleagues at, at, at Harvard Law School, looking at Medicaid Section 1115 waivers, which allows states to, to innovate with Medicaid to use dollars to pay for nutrition, education, or food. And what the graph shows is the um, uh, submission date for the Medicaid waiver and the approval date for the Medicaid waiver, not the end date. All of these are still active. So any, any one you see here is still active on, and ongoing. And you can see at the top, there's a few states that have done these Medicaid 1115 waivers and not focused on nutrition at all. They focused on opioids or mental health or housing or other things. But there's many more states that have included at least you know, strong, meaningful nutrition education in their 1115 waivers, and even many more states, especially all the states that have recently applied for uh, Medicaid waivers in, in green, which are actually integrating full food as medicine programs into their Medicaid programs. And so already here, we have 20 states represented, right? 40% of the US represented. And I think within a couple of years, every state is gonna have innovations and testing of food as medicine in, in Medicaid. So this isn't a theoretical thing that, that, that we're going to have food-based nutrition interventions in healthcare. This is happening now live. And I was having a conversation uh, er, earlier today and wondering what the dollar amount is here. You know, we haven't done that math, but I'm, I'm guessing this is over $2 billion uh, of, of investment in Medicaid in food as medicine interventions just in the last couple of years. So I just want to close by saying there's unbelievable national momentum. And here's just some of the examples of what's, what's going on. There's, there was the White House conference and then the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, where pillar two of the five pillars is essentially a food as medicine pillar, talking about all the things the agencies need to do to advance food as medicine. There's the state Medicaid 1115 waivers, which I've shown you. Uh, also, innovations going on in Medicaid managed care uh, organization services. In Medicare, there's also innovations going on in Medicare, uh, Medicare Advantage organizations and Medicare sh shared saving ACO programs. And also Medicare is considering implementing a, a larger medically tailored meal pilot. And we hope in the next you know, few months, there will also be a, a, a bill that you will see that is being championed by Congressman uh, Jim McGovern that's bi bicameral, bipartisan, that, has, that, that is just waiting to come out calling on, on Medicare to test medically tailored meals. There's many, many private healthcare investments happening, and it's interesting that I put up two of the best examples, Kaiser Permanente and Geisinger Health, who have really, among many, many other healthcare organizations, are leading in food as medicine. And it's interesting because just this morning, it was announced that Kaiser Permanente is uh, uh, taking on and incorporating Geisinger Health into their network. So, so two of the leaders um, are actually coming together in food as medicine, which is really uh, exciting. The VA and the Indian Health Services just this week have announced large uh, pilots in, in produce prescription programs. Um, as I mentioned, there, there's, I think, going to be a Medicare pilot announced this year. There's the Gustinet program, uh, the Produce RX program at USDA. There's CDC programs that specifically all now say we want food as medicine to be in these programs like SPAN and HOP and REACH. Uh, the FDA is prioritizing human nutrition. Uh, the, the Commissioner Califf wants to put the F back into FDA, and you're going to hear from Commissioner Califf uh, late, later, later today. Um, there's commitments to education of physicians from the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, the ACGME and, and AAMC and AAMOC, which a ACGME accredits all the medical schools and residencies and fellowships. And we have the director of policy here uh, from the ACGME. And they're, they're having active del 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 deliberations on how to make sure physicians get adequate nutrition education. The, the NIH has announced a plan to, to fund food as medicine centers of excellence, building on the really successful model of the cancer centers of excellence, like Dana-Farber and MD Anderson, and all these centers that have done amazing research in cancer to do that in, in food as medicine. The Rockefeller Foundation and AHA, who, who are both here, have announced a commitment to raise $250 million, a quarter billion dollars for food as medicine research. And of course, there's many, many 
other nonprofit and private sector implementers and innovators. So it's really incredible just compared to five or 10 years ago when I started thinking about this and doing research on this or others in the room who have been in this field for, for you know, 10 or 15 years, the momentum and energy toward food as medicine today is really incredible. And so I think we're at a tipping point where it's not a question of if, but when food as medicine is gonna be well-established covered benefit for Americans. And so you can go to your doctor and not only get you know, a prescription for a fancy drug or, or a needed surgery, and as a cardiologist, you know, those things are important. We want, we, we want to keep those available, but also can get a prescription for healthy food. So uh, thank you very much for letting me give those uh, opening remarks. Um, and it's my pleasure. <laughs> And, and for those online, I apologize. I know most of the people in the room. I should have introduced myself. My name is Dari Mozafarian. I'm a, a faculty member here at, at Tufts. Um, but I want to more importantly introduce uh, one of our, our, our first keynote speaker. Our first keynote speaker is uh, Bashara Shuker. Uh, he's the senior vice president and chief health officer for Kaiser Permanente, which is uh, really one of the country's leading integrated healthcare systems uh, with more than 12.5 million members. And Kaiser uh, has been a terrific, terrific partner with the Friedman School on so many food as medicine uh, initiatives. So uh, Bashara, the floor is yours. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to some of the folks who are uh, watching us live here. I think I'm gonna get my slides shortly from the folks. Oh, it goes next. All right, um, so I am so excited to be here today. This has been um, a work in progress for so many years, and to get to see everybody here in person is, is truly exciting. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with Kaiser Permanente, we are the largest integrated private healthcare system uh, in the United States. We have a um, simple mission. We are about improving the health and well-being of our members and improving the health and well-being of our communities. And we truly believe that those go hand in hand. There is no way we're going to be able to improve the health and well-being of our communities if we don't do a pretty good job taking care of our 12.6 million members. Members, and there's no way we can optimize the health and well-being of our members if we don't do a good job at supporting efforts to um, optimizing conditions for health and equity in the communities where our members live. Um, we operate in eight states and in Washington, D.C. Um, we have about 12.6 uh, million members, over 200,000 employees, uh, more than 23,000 physicians across our network. And just like Darius mentioned this morning, uh, it was announced that together with Geisinger Health, we uh, announced the launch of Ryzent Health. Uh, Ryzent Health is a new not-for-profit organization um, that's going to be uh, focused on expanding and accelerating the access to um, uh, value-based care across the United States, and Geising uh, Geisinger uh, will be the first um, uh, to sign a definitive agreement to be part of Ryzen Health. So we're really excited um, about this, uh, this transition. But today, we're here to talk about um, uh, food and why food is so important for us as an organization. Um, we have been working in um, issues related to obesity, nutrition, um, access to healthy and affordable food for years as an organization. Um, and we truly believe that health doesn't just happen within the four walls of our hospital systems and our medical office buildings. We truly believe that health happens in the communities where our members live. So back in 2018, we crowdsourced uh, a question to our all of our workforce, all 200,000 plus, our 23,000 physician, and we asked them, what can Kaiser Permanente do to help address the basic social needs of our members? And obviously, more than 50% of our uh, respondents said we really need to look at things that happens outside of our hospitals and our medical office buildings, and food, addressing access to healthy and affordable food, rose to the top. So no, no question there that, that food became such an important part and topic as part of that, um, that exercise. And as we were going through, um, through this effort, we embarked on a um, um, effort that now is in its year uh, five, I think, right, Pam? Um, and we started by asking 
um, experts, experts internal to KP, but also experts external to KP. We've spent time with about 60 leading experts um, 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 across the country. We spent time looking at our own programs. What is it that we're doing when it comes to food within Kaiser Permanente? Um, we spent some time looking at the literature. What do we know? What's the evidence tell us? What are the gaps? What are things that we need to be focusing on more? Uh, we looked at policy issues. Are there roles that we can play? Is there a role we can play on advancing policy um, and advocacy efforts within the organization? Uh, and we've done something that I'm incredibly proud of is we spend time with our members who have lived experience. We've talked and engaged over 100 of our members who are dealing with food insecurity. They welcomed us to their home. They opened their uh, doors. They opened their refrigerator doors for us. And that gave us a completely different perspective on how important this topic is and how to start designing efforts to address uh, address those needs. So we were incredibly proud of that work. Um, and at that time, at the same time, we were starting to ask our own members, what kind of social needs are they dealing with? And we went into a comprehensive um, survey of about 10,000 of our members. And what we've learned throughout this process is more than 60% of our members have had at least one unmet social need in the year prior to the survey. Think about that for a moment. And mind you that the overwhelming majority of our members get their coverage through their employer. Yes, we have Medicaid members, we have Medicare members, but a good chunk of our members get their coverage through employer. And nearly um, 67, I think, percent or so of our members said they had at least one unmet social need, mostly on the financial strain, but about 30% of those members said they've had a problem accessing food. So it became critical for us to address food and security as an integral part of how we think of our role as an integrated um, health delivery um, system. What we also learned from that survey is once you have an one unmet social need, you are more likely to have health issues and you're more likely to rank your uh, health as poor or fair. You're seven times more likely to rank your mental health as poor and fair. And we also found that when you have unmet social need, those are not equitably distributed. Our um, uh, Latino members were twice more likely to be dealing with food insecurity than our white members. Our black members were twice more likely to be dealing with housing insecurity compared to our white members. So it became an integral part of how we started thinking about lifting up our social health practice, building a social health practice in a similar manner that we have a physical health practice and a mental health practice and try to integrate that in the way we deliver care. So over the last few years, we've built a portfolio of food as medicine uh, interventions and very similar to the chart that you've, the pyramid that you showed us, here's a snapshot of some of the work um, that we've been, um, that we've been engaged um, in. So you'll see, for example, um, uh, our work on SNAP. Uh, we know that um, um, access to healthy and affordable food is an integral part of how people can stay healthy. Um, so this is, we started this program back in 2019. Uh, Pam will correct me if I got that wrong. Um, and throughout this process, we've already screened more than 5.6 million of our members. And we've started with a uh, low-cost, um, simple texting tool that would engage with our members who will mo most likely qualify for SNAP, but don't um, are not necessarily enrolled. And we provided them with the support to complete their application, um, mostly through text messaging, but for those who needed extra help, we had the help that they need to be able to help them and guide them through this process. As a result of this effort, we have more than 123,000 completed application throughout this process. We estimate that this has brought in about $90 million in actual cash to the pockets of our members cash that they can um, use, to, that they will use to be able to buy food. But most importantly, it's also equally as important, it'll free up cash for them to do other things with it. Pay rent, um, pay their copay for their medications, maybe going on a vacation. Um, all those are important aspects of how we've looked at, at um, supporting our members enrolling in SNAP. And we do believe that that effort, it's estimated to have created about $135 million in um, um, stimulus to the local economy, as those are the dollars that our members will go and spend in their communities. 
Um, we've also um, spent time on building medically tailored meals. And uh, Pam will tell you, and she told me, that as we started that effort and we started talking to experts across the country, uh, what we've heard constantly is KP needs to be much more engaged in medically tailored meals, and not just as an intervention or as a program, but really as help building the evidence. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. We have 2,100 uh, members enrolled in medically tailored meal studies. We've provided more than 116 uh, thousand uh, meals throughout this process. Produce prescription is um, our newest effort. We're really excited um, about that, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but we have about 450 members, Medicaid members with diabetes in California who are enrolled in this um, randomized controlled trials, and we've done about 7,200 uh, food boxes throughout this, this program. Um, we also, the, the start of our food as medicine effort at the organization um, coincided with the, um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And what happened at that time, we've realized that many of our members who were testing positive for COVID were also struggling with access to healthy, uh, with access to food. So we've um, started a program where we've enrolled about 2,800 um, members who've tested positive and who are also food insecure uh, with having access, uh, access to meals. We've also uh, launched a healthy savings coupon in about 3,000, with 3,000 uh, retail locations, about 23,000 members registered for this program. Um, one other program I'm really excited about, and I think we've had some, um, a pilot in, um, in um, Northwest, in um, um, Oregon, um, where we've been spending some time trying to understand how do we support our members enrolled in, enroll in WIC. There's a lot of the um, main focus of why WIC is there and why we are there to support our members. There's a lot of alignment. So we've been spending a lot of time piloting that effort with about 360 uh, members to help them enroll in WIC, help them connect them to the services agencies that would support that effort. And as a result of this process and through a, a human-centered design, now we have an approach of how we're going to be able to take that uh, to scale. So that gives you a flavor of how we're thinking about our uh, food and nutrition security uh, portfolio within the organization. And I do want to just kind of take a step back and just say from, from an organizational perspective, obviously our most important part of the strategy is supporting our members. It's making sure that our members who are dealing with food security matters are being able to get the support that they need so we can give them access to healthy and affordable food. So that's the bottom, that's like really the number one, the first and foremost uh, part of the strategy. But at the same time, we also believe we have a big role to play in help building the evidence. Uh, we have a big role to play in help leading a national dialogue. And we do want to help accelerate the food as medicine uh, movement. Um, I think you, you've heard from, uh, uh, from Darius, we've done um, multiple pro uh, studies right now on medically tailored meals. We have three randomized control studies that are happening um, or happened at KP. They're published now where we've enrolled 2,100 um, uh, members, 116,000 meals were provided to patients and their households. And the way we've designed those studies is to make sure that would give us answers that are going to be really, really critical when you're thinking about taking such a program and taking it to scale. When you want to go and start saying, oh, we need to cover the service, we have to understand the evidence behind it. So we've designed these studies in a way that would allow us to understand what medical conditions would benefit from this type of intervention? For how long do you provide meals? How many meals do you provide per day? Do you provide meals to just the member or do you provide meals to the full household? So those are critical, important questions that we're trying to answer as part of the um, uh, part of the studies that, that we've, uh, we've designed. Same thing goes to produce prescriptions. I just saw Dr. Claudia now. I don't know where Claudia is, but um, um, really an important effort to help us understand how can we leverage produce prescriptions for our uh, Medicaid members with diabetes. And I think we're now in Southern California where we're tracking, uh, on the, um, uh, tracking the impact of that on their hemoglobin A1C and other, other health outcomes. And that's the level of rigor I think that I'm excited about as part of our uh, food as medicine um, um, effort. And then I would just say, uh, finally, you know, as part of building the movement, we're incredibly proud of to being part of the um, effort that um, uh, part of the administration effort on uh, developing the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. We have made a commitment of 50 
million dollars around four different areas if you want. One, we'd want to continue our efforts to support our members enrolling in, um, in um, uh, government programs to help address their, uh, their nutrition needs. Um, two, we're going to continue to invest resources in um, in our um, building the evidence movement, if you want, and we're really excited um, about that. Three, and I think it was in the pyramid that Darius shared, which is it's really important that we engage our community-based organization, understand what's needed in the community, what's the advocacy agenda needs to look like. So we're committing resources uh, to doing that. And finally, uh, we're also committing to making sure that we uh, continue to engage with businesses to better understand innovative opportunities there to help us uh, address this important issue. Again, for us as an organization, this is integral to who we are, integral to how we're thinking about health and healthcare. I'm incredibly proud. I see there's a bunch of folks from KP here. I saw Lowell, I saw Dr. Linda Shu, Claudia Now, I think I saw Allison, and obviously Pam and Melissa who've been doing some amazing work over the years. So thank you for having us here. We're gonna continue to learn from each other and we'll continue this movement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shukair, for sharing all of that really exciting and really inspiring information. Um, I want to introduce our, our first panel. I'm going to invite them to come to their seats while I introduce them. We designed this transition really intentionally to reflect on Dr. Shukair's examples of optimism and success and um, inspiration and to get really down in the weeds to discuss some of the very real challenges um, in, in making these transformations within healthcare, within insurance plans, within health systems, in the patient-provider relationship. Um, so, so this was by design, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, please give a warm welcome to Josh Troutwine, the CEO and co-founder of About Fresh, who will be our moderator for this panel. And we will include about 10 minutes of questions from the audience um, after they've all had a chance to, to present and discuss. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, I guess. Uh, my name is Josh Troutwine. I'm the CEO of About Fresh. We are a national nonprofit based here in Boston that works with a, a national network of healthcare organizations to combine grocery retail infrastructure, payment technology, uh, data and analytic tools, and then community-driven activism to empower people to access and afford all the food that they need to be at their best. And um, it's my pleasure to be filling in for Alyssa Wasson, brilliant mind, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, with us today to moderate our first panel covering a very broad topic, uh, looking at the biggest challenges in realizing all the healthcare transformation we've been discussing to unlock widespread adoption of food as medicine. Uh, we have a great panel here with us today. Um, to set some initial context, I, I think it's important to name that all of the momentum um, that Dari has illuminated for us today is thanks to the tireless work and advocacy of community-based organizations and leaders in uh, significant gains in healthcare payment reform um, over the last decade. You know, food as medicine, interventions, medically tailored meals, uh, produce prescriptions, grocery delivery programs have demonstrated strong uh, positive outcomes on local and regional pilots and hold promise to deliver on like a, a future where everybody does have all of the food that they need to be at their best, regardless of your, your zip code, your culture, your mobility, uh, or your health status. Uh, you know, in service of contributing to more positive health outcomes and um, in a manner that's cost neutral to our healthcare system. And we're enjoying a moment of tremendous political momentum and, and investment that we've referenced already here today. Um, however, we still have work to do to effectively uh, scale and sustain all of that momentum. We're not there yet. Um, so that's what we're going to get into as a part of this panel. And, um, you know, to it's important too, I think, to like set a frame for the discussion that we'll have today that we need to do that in a manner that is equitable, cost-effective, and consistent with all of those original core values of the community-based organizations uh, that have led this work. And you know, it involves a really complex um, web of considerations, right? Like we are traversing both the healthcare system and our food system. So we need to take into consideration certainly sustainability and funding, technology infrastructure, bi-directional data sharing, um, clinician and care navigation capacity so that we're not overburdening our providers that are provisioning food as medicine. 
Um, we need to navigate all the standards and definitions and regulations that govern the provision of food as medicine. And most importantly, we need to make sure that all of that accounts for um, the diversity of cultures that are represented across food as medicine consumers. So we're going to dive deep into all of those topics over the course of the next few days, but we're going to keep it broad uh, with this panel for now. Um, this is just going to be a great way to, to set the table for the rest of the conference. And you know, we're going to try to get at the specific questions of what are we trying to scale? And uh, what are the challenges we face toward realizing widespread adoption of food as medicine across our U US healthcare system? We should be able to knock that out in 40 minutes, right? No problem. All right. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our, our wonderful panelists here today. Uh, right here next to me, I have Dr. Shantanu Agrawal, the Chief Health Officer at Elevance Health. Um, Dr. Daphne Miller, Clinical Professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And Dr. Christine Going, uh, Food Security Office Coordinator at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, thank you all for making time today to share your expertise. Um, Dr. Agarwal, if, if you could just briefly share with us one minute, um, just your, your role at Elevance and your relationship to food as medicine, and we'll just go down the line. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, so Elevance Health, uh, for those who, who may not recognize the name, um, you, we are a health benefits company and insurance company. We insure about 47 million Americans um, across Medicare, Medicaid, the duals population, the individual ACA exchanges, and of course, employer-sponsored insurance um, in, in, I think, 25, 26 states across the country. Um, in your local market, you may uh, know us as Anthem or WellPoint or Amera Group, something in that family. Uh, so I'm the Chief Health Officer for the Enterprise, and uh, really this is a, a new role for us. Um, and my job is really looking at health, uh, health broadly for our members across you know, that entire set of 47 million Americans and um, trying to make sure that we bring um, together their physical health care with their uh, mental or behavioral health care and their social care. Um, so we have been conducting, you know, much like Bashar had talked about in his introduction, um, we've been looking at our member social needs and, of course, uh, food, uh, food insecurity, nutrition insecurity rise very quickly to the top of those needs. And so there's a host of programs that we've also been launching both through our company as well as through our foundation in order to address this area. And I'm happy to obviously get into more details around that. Hi, I'm Daphne Miller. And honestly, I'm not quite sure why I'm here, so I'll tell you reasons why I might be here. Uh, and you can take a guess about which one in, uh, was the reason that I was invited. Um, first and foremost, I really want to emphasize that I'm an eater. Um, and I think that that's something that's really important to remember because I go to these types of conferences often and we forget that it's food we're talking about, which is something that is delicious and nourishing and connects us to family and community and and our past. Um, I, uh, let's see, from the macro to the micro, I, I work for Lifelong, which is um, a, as a faculty member in their family medicine residency program. And as such, I am actually the institutional lead on a big project in North Richmond, California. I don't know if any of you are from the Bay Area, but this is one of the most under-resourced communities in the Bay Area, and it's a $36 million grant called Richmond Rising, which is actually to grow health equity through, um, a, a, you, it's a multi-stakeholder program, and it's growing health equity literally through food um, sovereignty and security and climate resilience. And we have farmers and community members and solar installers and um, urban designers and, um, and, and, and healthcare at the table uh, doing this project in North Richmond. Um, I also educate the next generation of health providers, not just physicians, but a number of different uh, specialties within the family medicine residency program on food systems. So not just on nutrition and food, but really understanding how things interconnect. Um, and I also provide care in two different food as medicine group visit models. Uh, one of them is actually Recipes for Health. Dr. Chen, who's gonna be up next, uh, is running that program. Um, and finally, I, I'm a storyteller. I write about food and health um, and have regular contributions to the Washington Post and their science section, which I suspect might be one of the reasons I'm up here. But uh, lovely to be here. 
Great, thank you. Hi, uh, Christine Going. I'm from the Department of Veterans Affairs. And um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, as you may or may not know, is the largest integrated public healthcare system. And with that, we are able to really have a broad reach, hoping to care for the 30 million veterans that are in the United States. That being said, the VA has um, just launched a office dedicated to food security. So we're really excited about that, being one of the first that we're aware of that has really just dedicated an interdisciplinary office. Um, I myself happen to be a registered dietitian, but we have a nurse, a social worker, dietitians. Uh, we have communication and legislative affairs types folks understanding the breadth of this topic. And I'm also really excited to be here. The VA has been working on this for greater than six years. And we'll start talking about some of the ways we have tried to spread this within an organization that crosses the entire country. So I'm looking forward to our talk. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all again. All right, let's get started. Um, Dr. Agarwal, I'm going to put this question to you first, but I'd, I'd love for our other panelists to respond. When we're talking about scaling food as medicine, and I think this is different respective of, of each of your three environments that you work within, can you bring into focus and offer us sort of a framework of like, what are we solving for? Like, what is it that we are trying to build? Yeah, that's great. So um, maybe I'll, I'll set the table a little bit. So we've surveyed our members, much like Bashar described. And when you look at um, our members, about 70% of our Medicare and commercial members, so that is in employer-sponsored insurance as well, are experiencing at least one social need. 30%, about a third of them, are experiencing three or more. In Medicaid, those numbers rise significantly. 70% uh, Medicaid and duals are, are experiencing uh, three or more social needs, and nearly 100% of them are, of course, experiencing at least one. Food insecurity, uh, writ large, and I would argue, you know, the survey probably didn't do a great job of separating food from nutrition insecurity, but that general um, need um, is basically number three across all of those different social needs, right? So there's affordability and healthcare access that also rise to the top. So it gives you a sense of we have a massive, in, in our membership, which I think is pretty reflective of the country, a massive uh, issue around food, uh, making sure people have access to enough food and making sure that food is is healthy. So, you know, what's also fascinating is when you, you know, take that data and then look at claims, right, which we can obviously do, there's an incredible correlation between social needs, different types of social needs, and then healthcare behavior. Namely, you can start to see the emergence as social needs stack up. You can see the emergence of behavioral or mental health needs, particularly anxiety and depression, and you can then see the emergence uh, of physical health needs, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, CHF, heart, um, uh, you know, CAD, et cetera. And this survey also looked at every age group, uh, including surveying caregivers of kids and finding that there was a certain you know, caregiver reported set of social needs that then tracked to um, that child's other kind of physical and mental health needs. Um, so it, it paints, uh, I think, a, a really critical picture that this is an area that we must address if we are going to address disease burden generally, both mental health as well as physical health. Um, you, you can see organizations like ours and um, you know, really kind of respond to this need in a, in a multitude of different ways. There are lots of um, um, MTM programs or medically tailored meal, meal programs. There are uh, coupon programs, um, grocery card programs being tried in a multitude of markets. And I, and I think sort of challenge number one is there's a great deal of evidence of need. There's a great deal of evidence outside my industry showing that that need can be met. Um, oftentimes that, that evidence is created in an academic medical setting, in um, you know, just sort of university settings within a research paradigm. The challenge is connecting that kind of research to sort of the quote unquote real world implementation environment that we're in uh, and showing that we can roll out real food solutions that uh, meet our members where they are and that matter and that take advantage of community resources. Um, I could go on about challenges. Let me say one more thing really quickly. I think the work of foundations, and again, you saw Bashara speak to this, is also critically important because we can infuse capital in communities and um, help to build up resources of communities through our nonprofit arms, essentially. And so our foundation is doing that as well. We've committed $30 million over three years. That was a commitment that started last year. And by next year, we'll actually probably overshoot that amount going specifically to food as medicine programs and trying to empower communities so that um, we are bringing food to food banks and pantries so that it's not only our members, but frankly, you know, the entirety of those communities that can benefit. So I think, I think this is really critical, you, you know, trying to do 
programs, execute programs that work for our members in a very disease-oriented way. Um, and that focus, uh, to me, is very critical. But then also making sure that we are um, uh, working with communities directly and trying to bring more resources to them. And, and Dr. Going and Dr. Miller, if you could build on that um, original question and maybe elaborate specifically on how your communities should be involved in shaping that investment, that deployment of uh, funding into food as medicine would be great. Yeah, so um, I, 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 I might uh, Invite you turn that on its head views. a little bit because I love that pyramid that was up there. Uh, but I guess my concern is when you actually look at infusion of dollars and sort of enthusiasm for these projects, you actually have to tip the pyramid on its head. Uh, really where we're putting a lot of our focus and a lot of the excitement is in the MTMs, which is really serving a very small subsection <laughs> of folks. And yet, um, when I hear about food as medicine and also where, you know, there's been an enormous, enormous amount of private interest and corporate interest, it really has been at that top little bit. So my question is, how do we really build the bottom of that pyramid? And I think that that is something that is going to require a big tent and a lot of different solutions. And my colleague here in the private insurance uh, world has some actually really interesting ideas. And part of the problem is we've had a full conversation offset here, so now we have to sort of bring it back. Um, but. Uh, Really, how do you not just invest in the MTMs and in the, in the prescriptions, but actually move those dollars into communities? We know, and uh, respectfully, Dean, yes, food is a determinant of health, but it is entwined with all those other social determinants of health. And we know that the number one reason behind food insecurity is lack of capital, lack of wealth, poverty, and you know all of the things that are attendant to that. So healthcare needs to go deep and address that. We need to harness the power of food, but in a way that is not just in our regular sick model, not just in a screen and provide model. So that is the challenge, and that's what I know the VA has been thinking about, but that's what I really hope that our private insurance colleagues will join us in, in terms of the um, solving. Great, and thanks for the lead-in. Um, so with the VA being um, the size and enterprise that we are, we really are seeing, we are, our, our focus has been over the last six years, and particularly in the last year in forming this office, in how do we make, how do we build this into the infrastructure across the enterprise? We know we have lots of great examples throughout the VA, but they're not, you know, there might be a really good program in Maine and then another one down in Ohio, but how do we make sure it's happening everywhere? And um, because of the integration of our system, we can do that. And we're really harnessing the whole health approach that the VA has taken. So patients centered care and whole health is already part of how VA renders its care. And for those of you who might not be familiar exactly with what we do, kind of at the very core of whole health for us is instead of asking the veteran, what's the matter with you? We ask them what matters to you. And when we twist those words just slightly, we're able to really address them and meet them where they are. And that allows us to wrap our arms around the social determinants of health. It's no you know, accident that the office is interdisciplinary. And the fact that we have a screener and our expectation is that every veteran is screened in their primary care visit, we started there because we figured that's usually the entry point into our healthcare system is through primary care. And then, and, and it can be mental health primary care as well, depending on how you access and use the VA. But if we screen you in primary care and then you screen positive, then the nurse is usually the first person you're encountering. And they're gonna view you through the lens of a nurse and start to do things, whether it be medication reconciliation, start to connect some dots like, oh, I also know you're diabetic or you're this or you're that. And then they're gonna hand you off and say, would you like to speak with a social worker and or the dietitian?" And it's at that point, the social worker can wrap their arms around them and really provide the services. Because we agree that if you're positive for food insecurity, there are probably other things going on that the social worker can really help you with. And then the dietitian is where we think, where we really connect the dots, um, because it's only with medical nutrition therapy that we see us being able to, in combination with social work, break the cycle and hopefully move our veterans towards thriving. Uh, thank you all so much. That was a, a great way to frame up the conference and the rest of our discussion. 
Um, we've talked a lot about this success and promise of like relatively small scale pilots, but how do we build on that? How do we take those learnings and operational insights um, and turn them into sustained regional, larger regional and national investments? Uh, Dr. Going, I'd love for you to jump in on that question. Sure, so from a scaling for us, um, one of our biggest challenges is the way uh, the VA is paid. So unlike private hospitals and stuff, we get our money through appropriated funds, so your tax dollars. So, and we're given really strict rules about how we can spend those dollars. So when it comes to buying food, right now the law tells us we can spend it on direct medical care, which means we can feed patients who are in a bed. So whether they're in acute care, they're in a CLC or a residential care program. But when it comes to feeding them in an outpatient status or allowing us to build a food pantry, which we're starting to call food hubs because we see them as great access points to care, but still, for us to be able to do that, we have to partner. So its partnerships are really important to the VA, and that's why um, many of us saw each other just two days ago in DC when Rockefeller American Heart Association um, announced our formal partnership with Rockefeller Foundation. <laughs> Again, they're one of many formal partnerships we have, but those partnerships allow us to use funding for veterans not in an acute, not in a bed. And it's that those partnerships that um, allow us to scale. And so that's really important. It also allows us, the VA luckily has a really large arm in research. So similar to what you've heard everyone else doing, there is a significant amount of research. And I think as we've heard, that's really at the very core of helping us get the message out and that leads to scaling. I want to maybe add to that. We, we have a very similar, so in the insurance industry, there is a similar set of rules around what you can pay for in terms of care. Um, in our world, it's called the medical loss ratio, and paying for social needs is largely not included in the MLR calculation, and that is just a, a basic barrier in allowing funds to flow into this uh, kind of area. However, um, and, and so that's sort of a general policy issue. There are clearly changes being made both at the federal and state level that is kind of opening the aperture. So in Medicaid, there are states that have um, allowed us to start paying for this and including it uh, within this calculation. And then Medicare is kind of pushing in this direction as you saw earlier through quality measurement and other approaches uh, in, in how we're sort of assessed for payment. I think those two areas, uh, that movement is really critical. And when you think about scaling, so we have opportunities to scale in Medicaid. We're doing that today. Um, so we have a broad social needs program called Community Connected Care that we've been able to bring because of more flexibility at the state level. That program connects members, Medicaid members who have social needs to community-based organizations, and importantly, provides funding from us that flows to the CBOs through an intermediary. Um, and, and that is, um, uh, essentially, what we've done is kind of created a network of CBOs around the country in each of these 11 states that the program is currently in, um, in order to resource the CBOs, get members screened, and get their social needs met. That program, we're going to expand essentially to our entire Medicaid footprint because we can this year, again, because of that flexibility. The other sort of vertical we have a lot of flexibility in is the commercial market because really employers can decide what they want to do with these programs. We as an employer decided very early that we would invest in food for our own employees who are also obviously our members. And so we conducted a screening of our own employees, determined that there were food insecure employees of ours, and so two years ago created a food program, essentially a grocery card program for them that they could opt into, uh, and have been tracking outcomes for those two years. This is a truly scaled program that we are committed to, and have found that when you offer these employees uh, this grocery card, uh, they report less food insecurity, they report better mental health, and this is all at a statistically significant level that we are looking to publish imminently. It's actually been accepted and hopefully will get out soon. Um, and there are significant changes in ED utilization and hospitalization, and they actually use outpatient medical care more, which I think shows again the kind of incredible power of food um, and addressing this area and how it can impact other areas of whole health, which I think as a VA model is just uh, critically important. And just to jump on before you jump in, um, another way where we're trying to scale it is that, you know, through legislation. So there, is, there are bills out there. So there's the new NDAA bill that's directed specifically to veterans where the VA has, we will be launching a grants program 
you know, dedicated to food security initiatives. So we're in the works making that now, and that will also allow us to scale it because we'll be looking at doing a number of different food and security initiatives and then obviously measuring their success. And again, it's another way of heading towards scaling. So I, I'd love to just uh, query that word scaling a little bit here because I'm not really sure what we all mean by it. I mean, in California, we have a little bit of a let a million flowers bloom going on right now with the, the um, CalAIM waivers. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. I know Boston or uh, Massachusetts has been another successful example. But you know, essentially using uh, Medi-Cal or Medicaid dollars and giving it to each uh, county's uh, Medi-Cal you know, um, um, health organization and asking them to use this to cover um, food needs and other social needs. And so um, it's happening in different ways around the state. And Dr. Chen is going to tell you a lot more about this on the next panel. Um, but what we're seeing is that when you allow for that kind of place-based solving, but with a larger rule attached to it, that there's some pretty creative stuff going on, uh, as Dr. Chen's project will illustrate. Um, but you know, some of the counties are still, uh, you know, are using those dollars in what I would might contend is not such a, a, a terrific way, investing more in sort of corporate food that's being shipped in from across the country. But what does scaling exactly mean here? And do we want this program to be uniform and too big? Um, one other thing I'd love to say is when I'm teaching my residents about the ways that healthcare can engage with the food system, I always talk about the five Ps, um, which are purchase, number one. We are some of the biggest we are the biggest purchaser of food in the country if you look at healthcare as a block. And if we did that correctly and very much in the healthy foods and hospital system, that would start to really shift foods, you know, local food systems and so on. Partnering and the wonderful examples of partnering with uh, WIC and getting patients enrolled in uh, SNAP are, are, I think, some of the most powerful ways, really serving as a bridge to those organizations. Um, promoting, so everything we can do to change CMS rules and weigh in so that dollars can be spent uh, more uh, locally. Planting, there's many examples of healthcare organizations that are starting to actually grow food on their premises and change their soil. And then the very last thing is prescribing. And I put that one with the littlest P. And I know that's where we're putting a lot of our focus, but I really think that's probably where less of it should be. <laughs> yeah, th thank you for all that, Dr. Miller. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to keep it rolling. You've made it clear that I think first and foremost, you're an eater and a food justice advocate, but um, you know, we live at this intersection of two really complex systems, food and healthcare, right? And each of those systems involve a really complex constellation of actors, many of which that you just referenced on the healthcare side, payers, providers, community health centers, um, you know, and an extended network of, you know, community-based care navigators. And then in the food system, we have grocery retailers, e-commerce, all of our food delivery infrastructure, and growers. Um, could you talk through, maybe on the food side, um, the role of uh, all of these actors within this food as medicine ecosystem, and then what cooperation could look like if we bring to bear all of the values that you were just describing. From the food side, well, I, I'm curious, how many people grow food in this room on, at scale? Any farmers? <laughs> we have two farmers in this room? Yeah. I think that answers the question right there. Um, you know, this is really, uh, you know, w w if, if we really are going to go deep and solve these problems, half this room should be people who are producing. Uh, and um, I, yeah, I, I see the mic. Um, great. Doc, Dr. Agarwal, do you, do you want to jump in and talk to us? What does cooperation look like um, between the food system and the healthcare system to realize this future state of healthcare transformation? And yeah, great, great question. So um, I do think it, it is a partnership-based approach. We are clearly not going to do it on our own. Um, we are still trying to figure out, to be frank, how providers are involved in this. I mean, uh, I think there's certain provider organizations, clearly the VA, other major health systems, that are pushing in this direction, that want to screen their uh, patients for food insecurity or, uh, you know, uh, the, the possibility of a nutrition intervention affecting their health. 
Um, many health systems are not there. Uh, many physicians uh, are not there. Uh, I'm an ER doc. It's challenging to think about adding one more item to the list or 10 more screening items to the list of things that I have to worry about or my colleagues have to worry about. Um, so it's hard to know exactly how to involve providers. We have created as one avenue in value-based pr uh, programs where a provider can get reimbursed for conducting a social needs screening and referral. We would provide the referral um, kind of infrastructure. They wouldn't have to do that. And I will say there's sort of less uptake of that than I would hope, but I think it speaks to the sort of the push and pull that providers feel or, or the kind of the question mark over where they are involved. I think food producers, food vendors, food providers uh, clearly are important partners. And there's a great discussion to be had about how much that should be local producers and providers as opposed to large national chains who will frankly be able to do it at scale and more efficiently, but that still may not be where we want the dollars to go. Um, I, I think there's, uh, you know, a multitude of questions around the funding, and we sort of started getting into it uh, in terms, not, not, not into it, but we were having a healthy debate uh, <laughs> about how exactly to move policy so that the incentives flow in the right way. Um, but, all, you know, and I do obviously affects, uh, that affects the VA, it affects health systems. I, I think there's lots of pieces that have to be put in place around that. I do want to a little bit sort of answer the question of scale. You know, we have three million people with type 2 diabetes in our membership. To me, an answer on scale is that they would be offered a food intervention alongside and potentially even before the pharmaceutical intervention. We have gotten very used to, that's good, thanks. We, I, I've experienced this in my own health with my own primary care physician. Um, We've gotten very used to the stimulus response around prescribing. These medications can be wonderful. They can be helpful to a member. I'm not suggesting they're never useful. But can we assess their food needs first and try to change them first? That, to me, is an answer on scale. We are nowhere near 3 million members. But I think if we can get to that and get them real sustainable food solutions, we might be able to obviate the need for other kinds of interventions. So um, I want to share how we're trying to be at scale, but also the approach we're taking as a large institution, which is um, a multi-pronged approach. So starting with the Secretary of Veterans Affairs sets the stage with his strategic plan for five years. One of the strategic plans is food security. So I think it was critical for us that the Secretary set the stage. The, all organizations have strategic plans, and those plans are to help direct all of us as to what is important because we can't do everything well. So I think ideally making sure that your leadership is on board and understands at the highest level. And then from a food security office standpoint, we deliberately built our office on three pillars. And it was partnerships, data management, and research and education. And then everything we do usually falls into one of those pillars. So we've all kind of really already spoke to how important partnerships are, both financially and also to give reach and scale. And then the data is critically important. Doing those screenings for us feeds directly into our electronic medical record, which allows us then to gather all sorts of data behind the scenes. So by asking right now, we use the hunger vital signs question the two question screener. So two questions gives us a whole bunch of information that allows us to then make decisions enterprise wide that can include diversity and equity so that we can see exactly where, do our, where are our food insecure veterans and what do they look like based on where they are. And then the research and education are naturally together. And when we say education, the VA, we're talking both to our staff as well as to our veterans and their families. So that's kind of how as a large organization, we've tried to figure out how do we wrap our arms around it, but also made it, make it systemic to how we provide care. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Just to give a, another perspective there, I work in a federally qualified health center where most of our patients do not have immigration <laughs> documentation. Most of them do not have any form of health insurance. Uh, Medi-Cal is, when we see a patient with Medi-Cal, we're like, cool, that's, that's good coverage. Um, and uh, these are also, you know, disproportionately folks who are racially marginalized. They're also disproportionately folks who um, uh, uh, are, um, you know, 
food insecure <laughs> and nutrition insecure. And uh, it turns out uh, that trying to give them services through a healthcare system is near impossible. And, um, you know, because they already do not have access to health services. So I do think that it's important to have that discussion. And when we're tying this to health insurance and to the fact that you have to come, you know, at least in contact with a medical facility, you're by very definition increasing health disparities in this country because the folks who absolutely need it most will not get it. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, so I think we want to turn it over to the audience uh, now for some Q&A. Thanks, panelists. Hi. Adam Shaivich from About Fresh. Hi, Josh. Um, Dr. Agarwal, did I understand that Elevance is providing grocery gift cards to some of its staff? Yes. Why don't you just pay them more? It's a great question. So these two solutions are not mutually exclusive. We are paying them more. Um, there is a difference, however, it turns out in the data when you look at the impact of a grocery card. So um, there is something, I think, you know, from a behavioral science standpoint, there is a value to the labeling of something being for a particular thing. So if you look at the uh, associates that we gave these cards to, we compared them against three different groups. Um, similar associates who didn't take advantage of the program, uh, associates in other companies who looked very similar to these associates, and then associates who were being paid the equivalent of the card, pay, being paid more the equivalent of the card. The intervention group was healthier than all of those three groups, statistically. So there's a value, perhaps it seems, to the card being labeled for good fresh food that is just different than giving them an extra dollar. Again, you can give them more money, I'm not arguing against that, certainly. But the, inter the question is, what is the intervention? What is it for? And does this have power beyond just more dollars? In fact, that is somewhat consistent in the social science literature, that when you label a thing for retirement or for some other purpose, it gets used for that purpose, even in financially strapped populations. I was ready for that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Sabelle Bjorkland. I work for Verda Health, and um, we reverse type 2 diabetes and prediabetes through dietary change and remote support. Um, we don't provide food, but we would work with people who do. And um, one of the things I was really excited about, Dr. Agarwal, and of course we've been talking with you guys as well, is this notion of starting with food instead of starting with medicine, or in our case, we can also move people off medicine. So when we all worry about insulin, we can make it more affordable, but it's even better to make it unnecessary. And we've been working with the VA as well. And so one of the things that we're really excited about is the whole movement here and how it ties to the remote support and monitoring and what we can do to really um, improve people's health who are already sick. So if there's um, any ideas you all have about how to pair um, these approaches with um, the produce prescriptions and others, we're, we're all ears and would really love to serve your 3 million people. I'll take a crack at that. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I think the intervention programs that we have to try are with, with um, like really as disease intervention programs. That moves the needle and it's very mission aligned obviously for an organization like ours. It moves the needle for our members, for their employers. Um, that is where I think a lot of these food programs have to coalesce. I, I'll just, you know, candidly, everybody's interested in this space. There's a lot of things being tried, a thousand flowers, I think you described it. That is true. Um, very few of those programs are producing impacts uh, and, and fewer at scale. Um, some aren't being even assessed. I mean, if we're honest about, you know, there's a lot of interventions being sold in the marketplace. When you do a review of just what is the evidence behind them, there's very little evidence aside of, you know, outside of the academic literature. Um, again, it sort of comes back to the point I made at the beginning about how to translate the evidence that is there into an environment like ours. So that is definitely where I would like to go, where we are trying to lean in, is bring these food programs to uh, members with chronic conditions to see if we can replace the prescription for a medication with 
um, with food, with the right food, with nutrition counseling. I mean, it's got to be a whole package of things. It cannot, to your point, just be the MTM because that's ultimately not sustainable. Yeah, and uh, ask ourselves the question, what happens when that benefit goes away too? Which it inevitably will. In California, if you bring your hemoglobin A1C below, down below eight, you lose your MTMs now, which is, <laughs> makes <laughs> very little sense to me. Um, but what are we gonna do to sustain these? Because unless we have solved for the underlying food insecurity, as soon as the, uh, whatever that prescription is goes away, we're back where we started. Dr. Goyne, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? I know this gentleman has a I question. think we actually, um, do we, one more? Okay, great. Sure. I, I'm good if they're good, yeah. <laughs> Um, I raise my hand as a producer. I to, I'm a recovering farmer. So, um, <clears throat> but Dr. Miller, I wanted to follow up on this scale and innovation, right? I mean, for Community Farm Alliance in Kentucky, people are very, very innovative at the ground level if you give them the tools and resources. And ultimately, I think those experiences help determine what scale means, right? And so our work with Appalachian Regional Hospitals um, and we started in one hospital in one county, and <clears throat> I think the hospital's goal is to get the food to the patients, right? But they're starting with their employees, right? For They have the very similar situations that you mentioned. And so we've done that in one county. Now they're going to the next county over in Harlan County, and it's looking a little different because Harlan is different from Perry County. But I think what we're learning is these step-by-step -step and building the confidence and the trust as well as uh, allowing for opportunities for innovation is ultimately going to create a scale situation for the Appalachian Regional Health System. Could I just jump in and that to follow up on that, part of the partnerships we talk about is the VA also works with a lot of veteran organizations that are veteran farmers because farming can also be really healthy from a mental health treatment standpoint. So again, to, I think you mentioned there needs to be a menu of options that we can pick from, and I think that's what the research is leading towards, which intervention, which patient, for how long. And part of that, that's what the NDA is going to be offering. We're going to offer five different ones. And one of the options the NDA will be doing is an agriculture program, because we do see the connections, particularly with veterans, whether it be PTSD, depression, where it's the combination of both. We can heal you and we can provide you with some food. So thank you for bringing up the farming piece. I appreciate it. Great. Um, so uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think we have any more time for, for questions. Um, so that'll bring our first panel to a close. We have a, a lot more to discuss, but this is um, a really great way to set the stage for the rest of the conversation. We'll have. Thank you. Great, thank you all so much. I think everyone in the room knows why each of you was on that panel. So thank you all so much for sharing so openly. Um, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Mozafarian, the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health calls for cross-sector initiatives to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity. Our next two speakers, our next two keynote speakers, one before a short break, very short, uh, and one right after the break, are going to address this strategy in more detail as it pertains to their agencies. So first, it's my pleasure, um, please welcome Commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Robert Califf, to share his reflections on the role the FDA may play in catalyzing food as medicine, and to put that F back in the FDA. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I, I feel like a killjoy after that tremendous uh, <laughs> discussion. I even got prepared remarks, which I, uh, I do a lot better speaking extemporaneously. But this is a really important topic, so I'm glad uh, to be here. And it's been fun to be back at Tufts. It's amazing to see all these people. I mean, since when did people start coming to meetings in person? This is <laughs> fantastic. So I know that uh, everyone at this summit has deep knowledge and great appreciation for the enormous and critical connections between health and nutrition, and we've heard a lot about in this last panel, and the complementary roles that consumption of healthy food and the healthcare system can play. I thought I'd focus today on the interaction of the regulatory system, the research enterprise, commerce, clinical care, and public health. Is that enough <laughs> to focus on? My vantage point is that of a regulator and a public health official 
but also in intensive care and outpatient clinician for decades, and for a good part of my career, a health system uh, leader. The goal is hopefully to stimulate you, although I don't think you need it after this last panel, to a re-energized state of activism. The stakes are enormously high, with the potential for significant gains in health through the redirection of forces in our society towards nutrition, health, well-being, and a common view of our interdependence, which I think really came out in this discussion. I'm sure we almost all agree in, in a goal of a world in which every person has access to plentiful, nutritious food, beginning in utero and even before conception, and continuing until death. And that blissful, ideal food state should happen in an ecosystem designed to provide biodiversity that's climate friendly, humane to animals, and generates meaningful and rewarding jobs for many people. Unfortunately, as I've delved deeply into the food world over the past year since returning to the FDA, I see a worrisome pattern that's analogous to the world of healthcare in which our knowledge and technology continue to advance rapidly, but our health outcomes in this country are failing. There's an increase, increasing divergence between the pace of knowledge generation about fundamental science and our translation of that science into policies and clinical strategies that improve the health of our population. Indeed, at some level, the beneficiaries of our advanced knowledge are people like us in this room, well-educated, relatively wealthy, or both. The overall aggregate health trends in the U.S. are moving in the wrong direction, and the disparities are accelerating, both in ways that involve persistent historical patterns and others that signal relatively new trends in our society. The overall patterns are clear. We're experiencing an unprecedented decline in life expectancy in the United States, so that the U.S. now has a life expectancy between three and five years shorter than our peer high-income countries. The difference is partly due to COVID-19, but also gun violence, overdose, and suicide, which are linked to societal trends. Unfortunately, we're also experiencing a broader backsliding relating to many diseases that we once had a handle on controlling, or we're seeing real progress in treating. Most painfully for me as a cardiologist, I share this with Derry, we're, we're facing a tsunami of diabetes and cardiovascular disease that has already started with the uptick in stroke mortality and flattening of other parameters related to cardiovascular disease where we were making so much progress. And the risk factor profile of our youth and young adults predicts a much larger wave of premature disease and death. Much of this negative trajectory is driven by ongoing disparities as a function of race, ethnicity, education, and wealth. But we're also experiencing a dramatic shift in rural populations. Our university towns and cities continue to experience improvement in health statistics. But just a few counties away in more rural areas, the statistics are quite different. I lived in uh, San Francisco for five years between my two FDA stints. If you go to Lake County, just three counties away, there's a 12-year difference in life expectancy. And I'm sure in Massachusetts, if you look at Boston compared to distant counties, it's the same. The gap between life expectancy of women and men is once again growing, with more than a five-year advantage for women something that we don't discuss enough. If we accept these epidemiologic facts, it seems obvious that we need to do something different. And I heard a lot about that here, but uh, we need to hurry up. Given the unique perspective of the FDA as a regulatory as well as a public health agency directly dealing with over 20% of the U.S. economy, and with a seat at the table with the other major public health agencies, the role of the FDA as a part of the solution deserves a lot of consideration. The overlapping issues of science, biomedicine, food, and public health at the FDA come together in a very practical way as we address practical issues that we encounter in the exercise of our regulatory responsibilities. In one sense, we're, we're doing our part. The U.S. is clearly the number one innovator in medical products, producing drugs, biologics, tests, and devices that fuel healthcare around the world. The Economist ranked us as the top in the top three worldwide in food safety, and also very high in nutrition policies, 
And as part of the science enterprise, we probably all agree, we know more about healthy food than we ever could have imagined several decades ago. But our translation of these developments into practice in both healthcare delivery and nutrition is, well, not delivering. As I look at the agenda for this meeting, it's good to see you're engaged in the translation we need, directly addressing the integration of nutrition into the fabric of everyday life and making sure it's directly addressed as we take on the social determinants of health that are giving the negative trends or driving the negative trends that I've discussed. The work at the FDA to ensure the safety of the U.S. food supply, provide American consumers with key nutrition information and support industry reformulation towards healthier products is a key part of our mission to protect and promote public health. By the way, you talked about a number of entities. We currently deal with 600,000 entities in the food part of the FDA alone, when you count all the farms and stores and grocery stores, et cetera. We regulate the labeling and safety about, of about 80% of the U.S. food supply. And our statutes and regulations require that American consumers are provided directly with key nutrition information. The iconic nutrition facts label that's on packaged foods, as well as additional labeling requirements for restaurant menus and menu boards, empower consumers by giving them the opportunity to make informed choices about the products they're eating and identify healthier foods. We've also seen how manufacturers can respond by reformulating their foods to create healthier products, thereby helping to foster a healthier food supply. In short, food labeling can be a powerful tool for change. When a food or food ingredient does not meet our safety standards, we can take definitive action as we did with unhealthy artificial trans fats, which have now been effectively removed from the food supply. We've taken other actions to facilitate reducing the intake of sodium and added sugars by issuing voluntary targets for industry on sodium and by requiring that added sugars be listed on the nutrition facts label. We're also planning to hold a public meeting to assess what more can be done to help reduce added sugars intake. And consumers also can have a significant influence on these essential areas of nutrition through their purchasing power. In addition, we recently proposed an update on our nutrient content claim uh, quote, healthy, unquote. As a naive cardiologist, I would have thought we would have this all defined by now. An updated healthy claim would align use of the claim on food packages with current nutrition and dietary guidelines and help consumers more easily identify foods that are consistent with healthy eating patterns. We hope and expect that manufacturers may reformulate and produce new foods in order to uh, bear the healthy claim. And we're developing a front of package labeling system that consumers can use to quickly and easily identify foods that can help them build a healthy eating pattern. Front of package labeling can promote equitable access to nutrition information, particularly for those with less nutrition knowledge. As you work on these policies, your voices are critical. Contrary to what many people seem to believe, the FDA does not unilaterally dictate these sorts of policies. They go through periods of interagency review and public comment, sometimes taking years before, because of different perspectives, and they often include detailed economic analyses. The trade-offs are adjudicated by the little-known Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Any of you ever heard of that so-called OIR? <laughs> it's amazing. I've asked, I've, I've taken a habit now of asking lobbyists and prominent people if they've ever heard of it. Almost no one has, which is fascinating. But it's part of the Office of Management and Budget and independent of the FDA. To the extent these policies influence the underlying substrate of your work, I urge you to watch which policy documents we put into our process and when. It is a matter of public record. We're also working within the FDA to strengthen our food oversight. Earlier this year, a lot of you know, um, we announced our vision for a unified human foods program that will combine previously distinct parts of FDA into a new organization under the guidance of a Deputy Commissioner for Human Foods. By the way, the job opening is not closed yet. If you know somebody, you might be good. Uh, let us know. In addition, we're creating a Center of Excellence in Nutrition 
which will elevate and strengthen FDA's nutrition portfolio. All this will allow us to focus even more on food policy and more specifically on helping to improve nutrition and supporting principles of uh, nutrition. We're excited to play a role in the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy, which you heard about, along with the HHS Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, Admiral Levine, who you'll hear from right after the break, and I think she'll do, do a phenomenal job uh, describing it. I want to emphasize four specific priorities in closing at the FDA where you can make a difference. First, across the board, we should be entering a new era of evidence generation. Stimulated by digitization and capacity to deal with big data, to analyze complex patterns in ways that were until recently simply impossible. We talk about real world evidence in healthcare a lot, but it may be even more important in food safety and nutrition. And we need the participation of people in the real world. I was pretty excited to hear about what's going on with Tufts with the randomized trials and the use of pragmatic methods, and also to hear about the lack of evidence for a lot of things that people are advocating and spending money on. We can close those gaps, and I think it's uh, critical. Um, second, as we improve knowledge through evidence generation, it's critical we educate our health professionals. Now, we played a role in that with joint programs with the American Medical Association and American Academy of Pediatrics, but simply put, more is needed. Health professional schools, including medical, dental, pharmacy, nursing, social work, public health. It's amazing. I think the Academic Medical Center with the most schools is Ohio State, which has 17 different professional schools, but they all need to be uh, involved. Third, we have to strengthen advocacy for nutrition, including resources and policies that can better support nutrition. I've tried to give you an impression that we may have great ideas at FDA that I really believe in, but they don't see the light of final policy unless they make it through the gamut of many other perspectives that have to do uh, with trade, the agricultural business, all the kind of things that you all have been discussing. Nutrition is significantly under-resourced at FDA, despite the fact that our calculated return on investment for funding exceeds that for food safety. Our resources reflect Congress's priorities, and you elect Congress. With the stunning prevalence of diet-related chronic disease, politicians need to understand the devastating impact of chronic disease and support the means for better prevention and management. And finally, we need to strengthen our ability to provide information and education, not just for medical professions, but for the public at large. This is especially important today as we confront the rampant misinformation and disinformation that is destabilizing communication, undermining confidence in science and the work we do, and weakening the faith in government and other institutions, including the FDA, but also institutions like the one we're in today. It's something that's affecting not just um, our work on nutrition and food policy, but every area of public health. Just a minute more and I'll be done. I know my time's up, but uh, this is, to me, actually the most important thing today. This, this misinformation spread largely through social media and online cable entertainment is leading people to make plainly uninformed and adverse choices regarding their health. I came off a call this morning about uh, the, the current stage of the pandemic. Almost everyone who's dying from COVID-19 today is either not up to date on vaccination or did not have access to a, uh, an authorized antiviral, and they're free. Uh, the misinformation machine is really causing a lot of death and disability. Um, and, and we see this across the whole spectrum, tobacco products and vaping, spurring the effect, effects of life-saving medicines, con and continuing to eat an unhealthy diet. Each of these bad decisions is made in the face of definitive facts that make clear these actions are harmful. Unfortunately, the information ecosystem increasingly linked to the social determinants that are so important for health is very susceptible to manipulation by people trying to sell adverse choices through persuasion and social identity. Misinformation about how foods can fit within the health dietary pattern is a distinct but important category of misinformation. It can confuse consumers who have many other issues to focus on in their daily lives, leaving them susceptible to influences that lead them to make uninformed food choices for themselves and their families. And it's often targeted to certain populations, including 
children are members of specific geographic, ideologic, racial, or ethnic groups that may be at increased risk. My favorite one recently is gummy bears, which have all sorts of different things in them now and sold targeted to children. We have an enormous opportunity to use the knowledge and technology at our disposal to increase access to safe, healthy, and nutritious food for all Americans and to provide them with information that can help them identify healthy food choices. Nutrition is a central building block as we attempt to change the devastating effects of social determinants on health outcomes. And it bridges, a point you all made so well in the last panel, it bridges healthcare delivery systems and social networks. I look forward to strengthening the efforts of the FDA to this cause and working alongside you to realize the enormous opportunity we have to improve health and quality of life in the U.S. through improved nutrition. Thanks, and as usual, I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting, but um, I'll get a detailed read, uh, readout and look forward to staying in touch with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Califf. Wonderful to have you here. We are so honored to welcome Admiral Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the head of the U.S. Public Health Service Commissioned Corps. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us today, Admiral Levine. The floor is now yours. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you today. I am Admiral Rachel Levine, the Assistant Secretary for Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. And it is certainly my honor to say a few words about how improving our relationship to food can help strengthen public health across the country. This is a key issue for the Biden-Harris administration. Last September, the White House held a landmark summit on hunger, nutrition, and health, in which I was honored to attend as Assistant Secretary for Health. That event produced an initial $8 billion package of private and public sector commitments and led to the publication of a national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. In my role, I oversee our Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, which coordinates much of the federal implementation of that strategy. We work very closely, of course, with the USDA. Nearly every pillar of that strategy is central to our conversation today. And I would like to share those pillars with you because I think they help us frame our goals very clearly. The first pillar is to improve food access and affordability by supporting school food programs, ensuring that children have access to nutritious meals in the summer as well, and reducing barriers to participation and by working to involve community members in the design and implementation of those federal assistance programs. Our second pillar is to integrate nutrition and health by investing in health-related social needs. This includes conducting more screenings for food insecurity and nutritional insecurity and offering nutrition services and better educating health professionals about how to help their patients make healthy food choices and be more physically active. We want to work in our third pillar to empower all consumers to make and have access, that access is key, to healthier choices by creating environments that support those healthy choices and by bolstering local food procurement. Our fourth pillar is to, to support physical activity for all by offering more opportunities to be physically active in communities and by supporting comprehensive physical activity programs in schools. Our fifth pillar is to enhance nutrition and food security research by filling nutrition research gaps to continue supporting the dietary guidelines for Americans and building the evidence base to improve federal assistance programs. Now, reaching these goals will require a considerable amount of investment. It will require cooperation and intentionality and effort on all of our parts. And that is why on March 24th, the administration announced the White House challenge to end hunger and build healthy communities. This challenge remains open to new partners. And one of my asks for you today 
is to learn more at health.gov, health.gov, where we have information and statement of interest forms for stakeholders. One of the most critical elements of our national strategy is the growing momentum around food as medicine. As public health professionals, the more we hear from patients and public health advocates, the more we agree that the health care setting alone cannot be the only place where food as medicine is practiced. Most current models in the United States focus on clinical approaches, but to maximize the value of nutrition, we need to extend beyond the healthcare system and build new relationships. We need to increase the depth and breadth of our partnerships and expand the list of potential beneficiaries of those programs. We need integrated models for access to nutritious foods and more intentional efforts to make healthy eating possible for the greatest number of people across the country. The real goal here is a nation in which access to quality nutrition is actually routine in the life of everyone in America. And while the clinical setting will play a role, we are seeing a great deal of innovation in sectors beyond the realm of healthcare delivery. And that is exactly what we need. At HHS, we want to cultivate this issue and cultivate an interest in this issue. And we want to become a catalyst for these innovations. And we need your help to do that. Another of my asks for you today is to reach out to social service organizations, educational sites, senior centers, city and local government agencies, and other stakeholders to offer your services and to see how you can play a role in the delivery of nutritious food to people who need it in your community. At the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, we are helping to reduce and mitigate diet-related chronic diseases by supporting a diverse range of food as medicine models. Over the course of the next 12 months, we will be convening leaders across the federal government to advance food as medicine efforts collaboratively. We also will also convene representatives from a range of non-federal systems that we believe must be included in a broader food as medicine context. Now, I have seen the value of innovative approaches to nutrition firsthand. Last month, I was able to visit Watkins Elementary School in Washington, D.C., and saw the Fresh Farm Food Prints Program. Fresh Farm Food Prints Program. This program teaches fifth graders and other grammar school students to grow their own food in a garden on school grounds. They grow, they, they plant it, they grow it, they pick it, they wash it, they chop it, they prepare it, and then they eat it all with a simple goal of teaching them about healthy food and making it available to them. When I was in Watkins Elementary School, this was collard greens that they had planted and they, and they were harvesting it. They chopped it up, they prepared it and they ate it and they really loved it. Uh, and this is fifth graders. And then they get recipes to take home about these issues. So when I say innovative programs, this is one model to keep in mind. You know, it was just, wonderful to see the genuine joy and, and, and fun that these students experienced during this food print program. And it made a lasting impression on me. Over the course of that morning, many of our goals, which are very challenging, but they seemed attainable. Our unhealthy American diet is not inevitable and it is not permanent. Food deserts are not permanent or inevitable. Hunger and nutrition are not permanent and they are not inevitable. People across this country have a national, na natural desire to live well. Nobody wakes up in the morning, you know, trying to eat to develop diabetes or obesity or other nutritionally related issues, hypertension and more. Our nutrition policy challenge is not really to change people's attitudes, it's to make it possible to, to actually live the healthy lives that they desire. And that starts by improving the social determinants of health. Everywhere I travel, it makes it, it is more apparent to me that the myriad issues we face at HHS and across the federal government, across our country, are actually interconnected. Social determinants of health, of course, are those social issues that influence our health 
that we don't usually think of as, as medical or healthcare related issues. Nutrition is a big one. Our environment is another. Economic opportunity, education, transportation and housing, all of them influence our health and they are all interconnected. The affordability of healthcare coverage is a big one, but it is a part of what determines health outcomes. It is only a part. Economic and educational opportunities, again, are social determinants of health, transportation, environmental quality. I actually oversee the Office of Environmental Justice, and I recently saw on a trip to New Orleans in an area called Cancer Alley along the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, how severely one's life can be impacted by close nearby pollution sources of which you don't have a direct control. You know, as we've seen with abortion bans across the country and challenges to transgender medicine and gender affirming care, the state that you live in, the political and legal context of the state that you live in is itself now a social determinant of health. And that is why collaboration on our part is so critical in the months and years to come. I am committed to President Biden's goal of ending hunger in increasing healthy eating and physical activity by 2030 so that fewer Americans experience diet-related diseases. Millions of people across the United States need us to push forward on policy innovation and need us to make more nutrition and anti-hunger programs available to more people than we ever have in the past. So for me, food as medicine is a clinical innovation, but it is not simply a clinical innovation. It is a call to action. It's a recognition that you can't wait for someone to get sick before we make healthy food options available to them. It's, it's, an, it's an acknowledgement that actually diet and food security and nutritional security is one of the, uh, some of the most important quality of life issues in our country. We as doctors, public health practitioners, researchers, caregivers, nurses, other medical and health care providers, if we're going to improve the quality of life for the people that we serve, we need to take opportunities like President Biden's challenge seriously, and we need to start working more closely together with as many stakeholders as we can. So I am very grateful to Tufts University and to Dr. Masafarian for hosting today's event. This is a timely conversation. It's a great opportunity for all of you to think about the connections that you can make in your community. And I know how fantastic a community Tufts is in the greater Boston area. I grew up in Wakefield, just a couple miles north. I am continually impressed by people working on hunger and nutrition. We know that heart disease is still the number one cause of death in America. We know that two in five American adults are obese. More than 10% of American households are food insecure at some point during the year. We also continue to have challenges with eating disorders, lots of challenges that we have. And we continue to work every single day to address these very real but very solvable problems, even while sometimes other issues grab the political headlines. Nutrition is one of the most important public health issues of our lifetime. I think it is a key to achieving our vision at OASH, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, of healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy nation for all. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you to uh, Admiral Levine. As mentioned, she was speaking live to us. She really wanted to be here in, in person, but was un unable to make it due to her other duties. She's uh, really leading uh, the implementation of the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health. Um, there's a lot going on. So for people that don't believe in the power of government, they're, they're really, all the agencies are working really, really hard to implement these things. And so um, as she mentioned, there's a new call, a new challenge to foundations, the private sector, community organizations to make new commitments beyond what they're doing now to help meet the goals. And we're very fortunate to have from the White House, Kellyanne Blazik and Will Mackety here. They will be uh, here at 5 to 6 p.m. in room 118, which is just to the left uh, here, um, to your right, um, it, to, to talk to anyone who's interested in learning more about potentially making commitments uh, to, to uh, the, the White House strategy. So uh, we're really thankful to 
the Biden-Harris administration and bipartisan members of Congress for supporting a, really the first national plan to address hunger, nutrition, and health in, in over 50 years. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to uh, 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 Ronit to introduce the next panel. Thank you. Okay. Super. Um, so now we are going to turn our attention to the impact of food as medicine programs on individuals and communities. Um, as our next panel makes its way to the front, I'd like to introduce or to um, invite you to come to your seats. As they do so, we will play a short video uh, that features Gloria Lopez, who is a volunteer community health worker and a participant of the produce prescription program at Adelante Mujeres. Immediately after that, please welcome our panel moderator, Pascal Jean, who is National Program Leader in the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So as soon as the video ends, Pascal will um, begin our panel. Thank you all so much. You guys can have a seat if you'd like. Yeah. Es Gloria, vivo en Cornelius y soy ama de casa. Los cambios que he realizado en, de compras en, a través del programa es que aprendí a comprar más frutas y vegetales. Los, los alimentos que antes no comía y que estoy implementando ahora en nuestra dieta son brócoli, berenjena, tipos de hierbas y muchas lechugas. Los cambios que he notado en la salud de mi hijo es que antes tenía anemia y ahora ya está súper bien. Sí ha cambiado en diferentes aspectos porque ahora ya estamos como más acostumbrados a implementar vegetales, verduras, tipos de diferentes tipos de jugos que antes pues a mis hijos le hacían el, la cara fea, no estaban conformes, pero ahora ya se están acostumbrando y creo que esto va a seguir. Lo que yo le diría a otras personas de este programa es que es un programa muy bueno, muy saludable y más que nada que aprende uno mucho. Lo que yo haría o me gustaría implementar más en el programa es hacer más seguido clases en persona porque eso funciona muy bien y hace sentir muy cómodas a las personas que vienen a participar porque aprenden más. Las, de las verduras nuevas que he implementado y que conocí en el programa fue la, el keo. Yo nunca lo había probado ni lo había escuchado. Sí veía las plantas en el mercado, pero yo no sabía qué eran ni qué se comían. Entonces también varios tipos de lechugas, uh, la berenjena también yo no la había probado. Y unos rábanos también que siempre nosotros conocemos solamente los rojos y no hay otros diferentes, pero al igual de saludables. He visto varios cambios. Los cambios que he visto que ahora nosotros ya no comemos tanta tortilla. Comemos menos grasa y hemos implementado más vegetales en nuestras, en cualquier comida que comamos. Ahora, si hacemos cualquier cosa, siempre va vegetales a un lado o ensalada a un lado. Lo que más me ha gustado y he descubierto es que puede uno mezclar diferentes tipos de verduras o diferentes tipos de hierbas para sacar un jugo delicioso. Sí, mi estilo de vida ha cambiado totalmente bien. Yo digo positivamente, porque ya hemos integrado nuestra forma de comer un poco mejor. La práctica que he aprendido a través del programa es a comer ensaladas con lo que sea y a integrar todos los días en la mañana un jugo de verduras o de vegetales, pero todos los días. Pues gracias al programa yo tengo muchos, muchas cosas positivas. 
porque nos ayudan, que ya no tenemos que preocuparnos, ay, ¿cómo le voy a hacer para preparar de comer? ¿Qué voy a hacer? O sea, siempre sale algo práctico y rápido que hacer. Ah, las presentaciones que más me han gustado son cuando nos vamos a clases de cocina. Pues me encanta porque allí me gusta socializar y allí conocemos a diferentes personas y aprendemos cómo las otras personas cocinan también. Me encanta. Lo que yo considero que es muy beneficioso es que aprendemos a cocinar saludable y eso beneficia a muchas de las personas que tienen algún problema como diabetes, por ejemplo. Pues a largo plazo yo me veo, quiero pensar que mejor que ahora porque ya aprendí cómo implementar varios cambios saludables en mi familia y pienso seguirlos experimentando tiempo más. Hello. Anybody else very hungry now after seeing all these beautiful fruits and vegetables? Okay, not only me, great. Hi everybody, my name is Pascal Jean. I am a natural, national program leader at USDA NIFA. I am one of the co-leading NPL that is leading the GUSNIP program, which we have mentioned multiple times here. Just a little bit about GUSNIP for those of you that don't know. Uh, it is the, especially specifically the produce prescription program supports grants that conduct and evaluate projects that pro provide prescription to produce fresh fruits and vegetables to individuals managing or at risk of diet or related health conditions. Um, between 2019 and 2022, um, NIFA has issued, funded um, two, over $270 million to approximately 197 projects. And I wouldn't be a typical NPL if I don't tell you that the RFA is currently open and closes on May 16. <laughs> uh, the program aims to increase the fruits and vegetable intake, reduce individuals, um, household, individual and household food insecurity, reduce healthcare usage and associate costs. So far, the program's findings find that, um, at, that the, those projects have increased intake of fruits and vegetables also as well as improve the food security. And also please note that the year three report will be um, released this summer, in June specifically. Overall, the GUSNIP supports farmers, increased access to nutritious food, aids in economic recovery, and contributes to resiliency and community. So that's basically a little overall about the GUSNIP program. But along with me, I have a great panel um, so far, two familiar faces for me and two new ones. So as they introduce themselves, I would like them to answer that question, which what inspired you to join in the Food is Medicine program? So first I start with Martin Richard. Should start with ladies first. But, uh, I am Martin Richards. I'm the Executive Director of Community Farm Alliance. We are a grass-based, membership-based grassroots organization in Kentucky and have been supporting Kentucky's farmers for coming up on 38 years. I'm really excited about this conversation, specifically about what it can do by utilizing local and regional food systems, the opportunities there, the economic opportunities. Our programs in Kentucky are already showing an eight to one return on public investment, and that's pretty doggone good. Um, as well as the opportunity to mitigate the effects of climate change and make our communities more resistant. And then the other one is to really uh, reorient the farm and food system, um, not only in Kentucky, but in this country. Um, that's what excites me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Conceda Paul. My name is um, Conceda Paul. I live here in Boston. I have Caribbean roots. Um, I am a recipient of medically tailored meals, or I was. So I have, um, I'll just read my first page because if I don't read, I don't want to ramble, so I put it down. So I will tell you also how I got involved. So I love cooking because, you know, the Caribbean background and creating my own recipes. So it was really disheartening for me when my anchor bone was dislocated due to a vehicle accident in 2021. So the bone actually protruded through my skin. The accident occurred outside of Tufts. So the ambulance, <laughs> yeah. So the ambulance took me to Tufts um, Hospital. So 
I was in a knee to ankle splint for several months. I had to use a walker, stay off my feet, so I could not cook. But I live alone, so where would my meals come from? So I went online and I started searching very diligently and frustratingly, I must say. And then I finally stumbled on the Community Servings, which is a coalition partner of the Food is Medicine Meal Delivery Network. That was before, though, the, the, the Massachusetts, Food is Medicine Massachusetts, before they launched their very user-friendly website. I will plug it, foodismedicinemass.org. Foodismedicinemassachusetts.org. So the FEMA website now provides an easy access to tailored portable meal solutions. It's a one-stop shop. But, but two years ago, when I was looking, I did not have that option. So therefore, I think it's important to have such services, both for convenience and for healthy outcomes. So I live on an elevated ground floor. It's one of those ground floors, but it's elevated. So there's a set of steps which were very difficult to navigate with my walker. So what I'd do is I'd scut it down on my hands and my butt, and I'd be dragging the walker with me. Before I would, before my accident, I'd walk about two miles, take me about 30 to 45 minutes. With the walker, it took me one hour to go four blocks. I was just hopping on one foot. So I was, and I still am, very grateful for those home delivered meals from Community Servings. Community Servings is a member, as I said, of the FEMA coalition. I am particularly grateful for the ethnic component because it reflected my own food preferences and cooking style. And I have no complaints at all about the meals or the service. But as the panel continues, I have um, some areas of broader concern that I hope I'll have an opportunity to put forward. Thank you. <laughs> Our next panel is Dr. Stephen Chen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Chen. I'm a family medicine doctor and the chief medical officer for Alameda County's Food as Medicine program. We call ourselves Recipe for Health. And I want to share about what motivates me through a patient. Um, Maria was a 68-year-old um, Mexican-American woman who had diabetes. And she was on insulin for 15 years. Her primary care doc referred her to our Recipe for Health program at one of our FQHCs. And I want to say that our Recipe for Health program is one of the first in, in the state to actually draw down Medicaid funding. So we are a covered service now. In addition, we had GusNIP funding in the beginning to help seed us to get there. So I think there's a really nice pathway from GusNIP to Medicaid. And our county is actually taking a no, no wrong door approach. You don't have to have just Medicaid. You can, have, you can be undocumented and you can access our services. Suffice it to say, she, uh, was have, she was using 72 units of insulin injecting every day. And we often start patients at 0, 5, 10. And so she was at a high dose every day. She had uh, muscle aches. She was taking a cholesterol medicine uh, to lower her cholesterol. And so uh, through this program, she basically, over seven to eight months, we were able to reduce her insulin down to 0 to 5. 72 down to 0 to 5. I was her doc. And it wasn't about me, though. I was, in the, I was a doc at, in this group medical visit program. So she had that. She also reduced uh, her need for the cholesterol medicines, and then her, a lot of the muscle aches, which is the side effects from some of these cholesterol medicines, went away. Um, and she had more energy. And she was, like, thrilled to get off of these. And then the last thing that was really interesting for her was she was able to reduce these low sugar events. When you're on such high doses of insulin, you often drip your, drop your sugars. So the question is, how did she do this? What was her recipe for health? And this is where I'm just going to introduce our program. Uh, our recipe for health and what she received was food and health coaching. And the food was not just any old food. This was food and produce grown uh, from our farmers, our BIPOC-led farmers, in a farm, we call it a food pharmacy, um, and spelled with an F, F-A-R-M. And this food was grown in a way, and I'm going to slow it down now because we only have two farmers in the house, right? So I have to slow this down. This was grown in a way using agricultural principles and practices that focus on soil health, eliminate and reduce pesticides, number two, and then number three, use natural processes to minimize, I guess what we would, in ags they say chemical inputs, 
nitrogen-based fertilizers and whatnot. We often hear the shorthand for the, this kind of description of agriculture as organic or regenerative or agroecological. She was getting food from this farm that we have partnered with to heal her gut, to heal her body, to get these impacts. But it wasn't just the food pharmacy. She also had the opportunity to get health coaching through what we call the behavioral pharmacy. And Maria, in our groups, these were group medical visits with health coaches, she was with a movement coach, Dancing Zumba. She was um, working with the nutrition coaches and actually looking at the kale like in the video and saying, how, how do I use this kale, never seen this, how do I make this culturally accessible or culturally adaptable, learning from the other patients. And she was also um, getting mindfulness practice in the group. And then finally, social connection with other patients and the group and the health coaches. So she had all of this together as part of her recipe for health. And the great news is she's not, she's just one, and that's my, my anecdotal experience. We had 3,800, we've served 3,800 patients so far. Um, over 800,000 servings of this type of shorthand, organic, regenerative, agroecologically grown uh, food. And she is, um, it's, and 83% of our patients are BIPOC. So we have that health equity lens. And so that's really what motivates me. It's not only Maria, but it's building the systems so that we can actually serve our communities more effectively um, and use uh, and, and serve our, our community-based organizations who are doing the work on the ground. So thanks, thanks for letting me share that. Thank you. And finally, a nice surprise today, Alexandra Covington. All right, my name is Alexandra Covington, and I work for an organization called Open Hand Atlanta in Georgia. Um, and so we are doing medically tailored meals, produce prescription. We have dietitians. I'm actually one of the dietitians on staff working on the community. Um, and our staff reaches all throughout Georgia, which we're really excited about. Um, and what brought me to food is medicine is just, I truly believe in those words that food is medicine. Um, and I've seen, you know, some conversations about oh, you know, food is not the only thing that we need. And that is true. We have to hit on all these social determinants of health that we've been talking about. But food just really brings us all together. Food is what helps us in many ways. So we've heard from so many people, you know, all these different statistics and things about the hospitalizations dropping. Um, you can feed people a lot of times, you know, less, it's more or less expensive than providing medications. But you know, thinking about other things like mental health, food is, it's making people happier. We talked about that a little bit with farming and, you know, that's exciting to hear. And I'm just glad that we're having these conversations. I really think that um, treating food is medicine. And really, I'm happy to hear all these conversations about people having foods that they're familiar to and foods that they're learning about, um, because all of these things combined just help our health overall. And it truly is medicine in just so many different ways. Thank you. All right, so my next question, I'm gonna start with Conceda. Um, thank you for sharing your story. And I would like to you for elaborate, why do you think it matters where the food comes from? So, so um, I'm glad I'm sitting next to someone who is into farming. One of my main concerns, one of my pet peeves is food ingredients. So it matters where the food comes from. So most people equate food with edibles that are produced on a farm. But if we examine our supermarket shelves, we will realize that most or much of the food that we buy and eat is not produced on a farm. It is produced in a factory, it is processed. And it can be labeled food because I was curious and I looked up what food is and I didn't use, I used an old fashioned Webster's dictionary. And it says that food is anything that provides nutrients for living things. However, if you have the money and we have spoken of income as a social determinant of health, if you have the money, you can buy one eight ounce jar of pure maple syrup for about $8 for your pancakes. But if you're on a tight budget, you may opt for 24 ounces of a popular syrup brand for about three or four dollars. And here are the ingredients, 14 ingredients. The maple syrup has one ingredient, pure maple syrup. 
So yesterday I actually went to the supermarket, took a picture, and let me read you some of the ingredients. Water, and I'm, I may not be able to pronounce some of them. <laughs> Sorbitol, and it has this asterisk next to it, and it says, ingredient not in regular syrup. Cellulose, number three. Number four, gum. Number five, salt. Number six, natural and artificial flavors. Number seven, caramel color. Number eight, isanthan gum. Number nine, sorbic acid. That's a preservative. The tenth ingredient, sodium benzoate. It's a preservative. Ingredient number 11, I hope I can pronounce, acesulfame, fami, fami, I think it's a sweetener. So it's acesulfame potassium. And the asterisk means it is an ingredient not in regular syrup. And it tells you, <laughs> it tells you it's a non-nutritive -nutri sweetener. Ingredient number 12, potassium chloride with the asterisk again. Ingredient not in regular syrup. Ingredient number 13, I actually had to put in dashes to pronounce it. Sodium hexameter phosphate. The scientists may know what I'm talking about. <laughs> number 14, phosphoric acid. And number 15, sucralose, which also has the asterisk. Non-nutritive sweetener ingredient not in regular syrup. So these are 15 ingredients. Some of them are not even in regular syrup. So you buy this because of your income buying cheaper, more highly processed alternatives that have multiple ingredients, and that is a function of income. So I am very concerned as to where food comes from, because if it comes from the farm, especially locally sourced and locally produced farms where you pick or community gardens, then you don't have these ingredients. And also chemical additives, and I would hope I have a chance to talk about the cumulative you know, when you, when you add it up, because you might have an ingredient and this, you might buy a product and they might tell you the lever of this chemical in the ingredient, it's okay to use. But over your lifetime, 20, 30, 40 years of using this one product and multitudes of other products, what about the cumulative effect? Does it add up? Does a tray stay? If I pick up one strand of hair every day and pile it up, how many do I have after 40 years? So this is another area. Very good. Note to self, check your syrup when you get home. <laughs> All right, anybody else want to add? Who wants to follow her after to answer that question? <laughs> I can add to it. Um, I think it's important to know where it comes from. One, because of all the things you just said. You know, people are worried about what is in our food supply. And I know we have FDA and other people here. So um, I know we have safety checks, but people are worried about these ingredients. And some of them are OK. You know, the food scientists in here know that. But our, our consumers have to be comfortable with where our food comes from as well. Um, and it's really important, not only that, but when we go to the grocery stores, do people have access to those foods that they're familiar with. Once again, you know, we saw in the video and you talked about Maria, like people see kale, but if you don't know what to do with kale, it doesn't matter if it even came from a, a farm next to you. Um, so it's, it's really important that we do pay attention to where those things come from. And also just recognizing not everyone has access to a lot of things. They may have a grocery store in their neighborhood, but what quality of food is it? It may be chicken, but I have seen even in, you know, family members' neighborhoods where maybe that meat is not something that you should buy. We've all seen that, right? We go into grocery stores and we have certain grocery stores we're not going to buy the meats or the produce from. Um, and like you said, everybody can't buy 100% maple syrup. So how can we have an impact and really just Think about, you know, what are people comfortable with? How can we make people more comfortable? How can we inform people that maybe it is okay to have ascorbic acid because it's a, um, a preservative? But we have to talk about those things. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I'd love to take this question. This is such an important question. Where does the food come from? Because I think we in the food as medicine work don't ask that question enough, especially as a downstream doc. You know, in clinic, we're just like, just get me any kind of food that some veggie, and hopefully that's good enough, right? But I think we have two, we have the flip side, a positive side and a negative side we have to manage. One is when you ask the question where the food comes from, 
you have the opportunity for force, what I've been terming force multipliers for health. And you have, to, you have the opportunity to guard against the economic race to the bottom. So I'm going to talk about both of those. The force multipliers for health, if we start really thinking about the food being grown in manners that are using agricultural principles, again, I'm going to go through those three things, of, of focusing on the soil health, on reducing and eliminating pesticides, on reducing chemical inputs to the growing of this food, we have an opportunity to move into human health improvements like with Maria and what we're hearing here, right? Her gut microbiome is getting better. She's reducing all these health outcomes. But the farm worker health, the people who are making the food, less pesticides and less impact. The communities in which they live in, all that less, there's less chemical drift from all the sprays. That is human health consequences when we look upstream as to where the food comes from. So that's human health. If we look at economic health, local, as Martin was saying, in regional, if we now you're using Medicaid dollars or Medicare dollars, and you know, healthcare is 4.1 trillion per year, right? If we just take some of that money and now invest in food systems, we have the opportunity to create local uh, supply chains like we've done, BIPOC led, uh, from farmers, distributors, uh, dis uh, transporters, all the way through. And now you have local um, opportunities for wealth creation that's staying local. And then thirdly, the climate piece. Again, Martin was talking about that too. When you have soil grown this way, or not grown this way, but pr managed this way, you have the ability to increase carbon sequestration into the ground, less CO2, less greenhouse gases, um, and we... we we then have healthier soils to increase nutrient density in our vegetables that we're growing. The water intake of these healthy soils is better. It's like a sponge. So when we have these, and in California, we have these atmospheric rivers, all these storms happening, we can actually manage the flood system better or in droughts. So we have climate impacts that ultimately affect us downstream in our communities. And then the last piece, and I'll say, is the equity. Uh, we don't want to leave provoke communities behind. BIPOC communities, rural communities, marginalized communities, when we're investing a sliver of this 4.1 trillion into an ag system or a food system, we want to make sure that those equity guardrails are there. So human health, economic health, climate health, and equity throughout. Thank you. Did you want to add anything? I could add a lot. Um, I'll try not to. 30 years ago, I was a pretty, pretty traditional Kentucky farmer raising tobacco and had cow-calf operation. Um, but I could see if myself and my neighbors, we could see the future of tobacco and it wasn't good. Um, so at that point, I started transitioning and uh, got about 15 acres certified organic, began growing vegetables. Um, but here's the beauty of, aside tobacco, and I knew it growing it, all my neighbors knew growing it that it wasn't good, um, but it paid well. And, it, and it, I tell you, it put so many kids through college in Kentucky, it was, it was the backbone of, of our rural communities. Um, and, and in the spring, I got my quota number, how many pounds I could grow, and I could do a crop plan on the back of an envelope, including going to the bank and getting a line of credit to get me through the year. When I started growing food, I couldn't do any of that. There were no programs in place for that. Um, and there were no markets, right, for that. Uh, till I got hooked up with Community Farm Alliance, they sucked me in and here I am. Um, when they started an organic farmers cooperative. Um, so, you know, what really makes me hopeful is that, you know, programs, the food is medicine program. And, and for CFA, that looks like we have a double bucks program called Kentucky Double Dollars. It is now at like 80 locations all across Kentucky. We have done a number of food prescriptions. Right now we have a fresh RX for moms. That's moms on Medicaid, right? Um, but the whole idea initially was for us, um, how can we get all these federal dollars that are coming into Kentucky through the food and nutrition programs, how can we grab those dollars and create the baseline of support for the next generation of Kentucky farmers like tobacco did for us? And this is proving to be that, right? And, and now we have so many more resources. I wish I was starting farming now. I wish I was 
30 years younger, right? There's so many resources now. Um, but that's what the opportunity is, to do everything like Stephen was talking about, you know, by supporting these kind of farmers who are being innovative, who are trying to grow and grow healthy land, food, people, ecosystems, um, and, and, of course, the resiliency aspect for our communities. It is the hope for rural Kentucky and, I think, for rural America. And the other piece is th that I want to add is a lot of people think that our food system is broken. It is not broken. <laughs> it is working exactly the way it was designed when we were coming out of the Great Depression and going into World War One, World War II, I'm sorry, right? And our goal was to produce as many calories as cheaply as possible and to be able to stockpile them. From my experience, our approach as a nation to our farm and food system has not changed at all. Um, and, and I think this food is medicine, especially the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, is the opportunity to reorient our farm system in this country from quantity to quality. And that will end up reflecting us in our health. Thank you. Very good. So I'm going to take a little turn now. I'm going to start with Dr. Chen. Um, what does success mean from your perspective um, for your program? Like the overall management of these programs, what does success mean to you? And how do you measure it? Sure, that's a great question. You know, success for us for many years was to become a Medicaid covered service. And we hit that in September. And that was massive, right? Because it was no longer relying on grants. It was able to fully integrate into healthcare. Um, I think the other, uh, where we want to take the success is to actually now be that backbone in our county to continue to support the CBOs that are doing this work. Um, we, the mechanism to become a medically um, covered service and then hopefully a benefit is a massive undertaking. It is data. It is, uh, it is detail. It is back and forth claims, 837 claims. You know what that is? I mean, yes, so, you know, you do. But that is not an easy task to accomplish for our farmers or for our community-based health organization or our community health workers or our uh, health coaches. So our success now is to build that infrastructure in Alameda County, partner up with more of the CBOs and say, we'll take care of the back end. You don't worry about that. You do with what, you're do what you do great at, which is take care of the community with the community. You mirror the community. And we'll take you there back and we'll get you the funding through drawing down on Medicaid. That's what we're, that's what success will look like. And I will say on a national level, I don't think we need to kind of reproduce the wheel here. We can actually take these successes and create a, a, a national mechanism to do this. I know every health plan's different, um, but there are some commonalities around doing this. And I think that's this the earlier conversation was on scale. I think scale will be appropriate scale, regional scale. And when we scale, ensure that local communities benefit and certainly have the national players for sure but let's have the equity guardrails around that so we're actually investing in our local communities thank you alex do you want to add more from your perspective from where how does food is medicine what does the program success look like sure um for me, it's a little bit different, <laughs> but it's probably due to our jobs and how we do things differently. But I'm looking at more of like the client perspective, you know, are clients happier? Do they have that self-efficacy piece? That's a big one to me. Again, do they feel like that they know what to do with these foods? Do they feel like they could go to a farmer's market, pick things out? Could they grow you know, a simple plant, like a tomato plant at home without putting a lot of pesticides on it. You know, those kinds of things. So that self-efficacy. Another thing would be that health equity. Um, so are we reaching all of the different people that we talk about, all of these different cultures in an equitable way? Are we not only giving them, like I keep saying, I know I'm a broken record, but are we giving them foods that they're used to? Are we giving them foods that they can try that are new? What about the herbs and the spices? Are we teaching them how to use those things? You know, looking at it in a more equitable, from a more equitable perspective. And then not only that, but of course, those chronic conditions, you know, making sure if they have chronic conditions, are they able to bring things down like the A1C levels you were talking about? Has their blood pressure improved? Um, are they off of medications? At Open Hand Atlanta, we work with a lot of clients that have HIV or AIDS and 
They take a lot of medications. Um, so, you know, really trying to help them come off of some of those other medications can just make people's day. I've seen it myself where I've worked with people for, you know, a year and they feel like their progress is so small, but they finally get to come off of that cholesterol medication and that can just make their day and it motivates them to continue. So to me, that's the success. Thank you. Consider Martin, do you want to add more? Okay, so success is, uh, so all the stakeholders have a definition of success. So like her, I am here on maybe, I, I am the bottom. I am the user. So everything that channels down comes to me or anyone else here who finds themselves because anyone here can break their leg and, and, you, and maybe you live alone or your kids are far away and you may find yourself also wanting medically tailored meals. It is not always a function of income, but for low income people, success for me is a function of income. So I am speaking from the viewpoint of the single mom. <coughs> this single mom, and I will use Massachusetts as an example. So we talk about the working poor. The working poor are people who work and are still poor. These are not people who are lazy and people who are on welfare. They are people who work. And I'll give you an example. Here in Massachusetts, the minimum wage is $15. <coughs> and so let us assume we have the single working mom who is working one day at $15 an hour. She makes $120 a day. She works a 40-hour work week. That is $600 a week. Six fours, 24. That's $2,400 a month before taxes, but we will forget taxes. We'll say she makes $2,400. Here in Boston, the average rent for a two bedroom apartment is $3,200 according to Zillow. Now, this working mother on her salary cannot afford to rent an apartment unless she's lucky enough to get a, a lower tier apartment for $1,600, which means 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, she has $800 left for meals, transportation, and all her life expenses. So income, which lives across the street from medically tailored meals, you see it is outside, it's not part there, it's outside, it's a neighbor, but it is also a determinant because you cannot afford to buy healthy foods without income. If you, you may go to a food pantry, you may go to the cheaper end stores, without income, you just cannot eat healthy foods. So success is a single mother <clears throat> earning enough that she can eat healthy foods. Great point. Do you want to add anything before we I take question? Lots, lots of stuff, but I'd rather take questions. Sure. All right. So we'll love to get questions from the audience. If you guys have any for the group. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to start talking. <laughs> There's one in I'll, the back. I'll ask a question. I love asking if no one else will. Um, I'm curious, actually, I think for Martin, but maybe for everyone, just if you can talk a little bit about the barriers from the farmer side of working with some of these programs. Um, so we talked, you know, we've talked about some of the best practices, but like what are the handful of barriers that you've had to break down and what's still in the way of making that possible? There's a lots of barriers, right? I mean, um, and, and I was gonna talk about success and I still think it, it's restoring the equity in, in the food and farm system, right? I mean, farmers of color, specifically African-American farmers have been systematically moved off the land. Part of success is moving them back. I was fortunate enough to, to testify in front of Senate Ag and Nutrition um, subcommittee in December. And beside me was one of the most amazing individuals, young women I've met in a while, Lee Penniman from Soul Fire Farm. And she pointed out the, kind of the obvious stuff. But, you know, because of where black farmers have been pushed to, you know, m moving into small scale uh, specialty crops, meaning fruits and vegetable production, as, as well as livestock, provides the greatest opportunity for them to re-enter farming. And for many of them, they still have access to small plots of land. 
um, to do it. And, and access to land is one of the single biggest challenges, I think, for any farmer, right? E even when I was farming, we had this idea that to be a farmer means you own land. I, I never wanted to own land. Good Lord, taxes and all that. But what I wanted to be was a good steward, right? To be able to do those, those kind of things, right? You don't need to own land to do steward, to be a good steward. But you have to have the kind of right arrangement to make that happen. And so, I mean, I, I think we're seeing it. It's an undercurrent of rethinking about what access to land is and, and how it means we hold land in common. Um, I, was, I was met, met some new friends uh, earlier today and talking about this, that I think the single largest landowner in, in this country, which is not the federal government, is TIAF CREF. And if you are in academic world, those are the folks who manage your retirement funds. <laughs> and they are investing that in farmland, right? Um, they're not making any more of it, right? And um, an investor-owned farmland is the, one of the single biggest impediments for farmers to having access to land. And, and corporate-owned land or collectively-owned land is in itself not problematic. It's what the expected outcomes from that investment is. And um, you're gonna have to shut me off here, but, but as, a, as a farmer, and especially when I was trying to restore tobacco land, <laughs> some of what you invest in that land, the return on investment, you're not gonna see for years. In fact, it may be the next generation that receives that. But for investor-owned land, they wanna see a return investment eh, like every year, right? So, um, well, shut me up because... Anybody wants to add? So I would like to add and piggyback on some of what he said because some of the people he mentioned, some of them, they use this land as tax havens and, we, and many of them are being subsidized and paid by the government to not farm. But we do not consider this welfare. We consider SNAP to be welfare. But when we pay millions of people to, who own land to not farm on it, we don't consider it welfare. So this is, a, this is also a concern for me as well. And I'm also interested in food harvesting because during COVID, if I'm not mistaken, farmers dumped milk. And I am wondering how do we harvest this food? Sometimes when farmers have fields of strawberries and they either don't want to pick them because it is more economical for them to not pick it and get a subsidy from the government and they plow this under. So how do we harvest these foods? And, and make them accessible to food banks and you know food pantries. And there is something I also want to say. With the housing and urban development HUD, HUD, when people come to HUD for loans, developers go to HUD for loans, HUD says to them, I am going to give you this amount of money to build a multifamily complex, but you must factor in affordability. So many units must be affordable. The USDA, and if you have to go through Congress, should also tell farmers, yes, I will give you a subsidy, and yes, I will support you, but you must also do certain things as well. Time is up, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi. Oh, Good. hi. Lots of questions. One more over there. Yes. Um, so first of all, this panel has been so energizing. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about equity and ask what your thoughts are on broadening the conversation to include the people who, like Conchetta talked about, you know, other people who are really being served directly by this, perhaps in very intersecting ways. Um, so I'd love to hear more about what inclusion practically looks like, and then if we have time, how that can translate into scale, not just in this on-the-ground conversation, but how we continually center those voices. Thanks. I'll take a stab at that. It's a big question in two minutes. Um, you know, when I think of, to kind of combine the question of success and how to measure it, I think especially if we here in healthcare need to get outside of only our healthcare mindset of what success is. Uh, you know, in healthcare, we look at health outcomes, healthcare utilization, health-related behaviors. Maybe we touch into social determinants of health, maybe patient experience. That's kind of your healthcare dashboard. Um, where is the equity in that, right? So we need to insert equity into that dashboard. We need to create a climate dashboard. And again, part of this intersectional piece where we look at the demand that we're creating in healthcare for this type of food, what are the impacts on the climate? 
And then what is the impact on the communities left behind or that are most affected? So that's like a second dashboard. We're kind of going from two dimensions into three dimensions. The third dimension would be on economics. So how do we measure job creation? Uh, who is getting these jobs in the supply chain, in this green economy? Uh, that is another opportunity for equity. So to me, you have three dimensions and a fourth dimension being equity, to your point, uh, markers all the way through, and that we hold ourselves accountable to that. Uh, and then food is this coming together as I think, uh, as James was saying earlier, you know, this food system and health system, you have all this equity stuff around farmers and the production that has to be taken into account. So kind of four-dimensional thinking, if you will, around food and health. Okay. Uh, one, more, one more question. Uh, Whoever has the mic. Good, after, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Julian Miller. I'm the director of the Anderson Institute of Tugu College, and I have the privilege of being partnered with Tufts on a food as medicine initiative uh, in the Mississippi Delta. My question is a little specific, Dr. Chen, to you and anyone can step in. W with, with the success of your program so far with the food as medicine intervention, have, has there been um, an assessment of the actual development of a sustainable food economy in these areas that is working to increase the supply chain for the benefit of BIFOC farmers uh, and workers in that area? And we're, you know, I'm biased with that question because that's exactly what we're trying to do and think about as we build our program. It is the key question. We have built a team, Dr. June Tester here and Lisa Goldman at UCSF and Stanford on the health side, the health outcomes. But that economic question is where I'm looking. Who, who is doing that work? How do we actually answer and build this into the food as medicine work so that it is, when we go before policymakers, there's four dimensions that they look at and they see the whole package. Um, I think that's, that question is a fundamental question. And then you tie it in with the question around equity and, and you, got, you got the whole enchilada. <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's, I've heard uh, health economists in, in Colorado are looking at that. I think the Tufts team is beginning to look at uh, some of this uh, through the last thing. Say, there's a bunch of possibilities, but we need to keep that front and center. It's not just about did the hemoglobin A1C go down? What's the dosage? What's the duration? What's the frequency? That's the standard stuff we do in medicine. We have to do that, of course, but that's not what this, we need to move beyond this, this that those kind of narrow healthcare things and optimization to broader questions given this moment. Thank you all. Sorry, we're out of time. Thank you, Consetta. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Alex.